pockets and cutting down the cost of energy uh, usage, but also, of course, will help us reduce our emissions as a country and achieve our targets. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We are now moving on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13338. In the name of John Swinney on Scotland Can Do, a framework for entrepreneurship and innovation. Can I just say to members who have taken part in the debate uh, that we have um, some time in hand today, uh, so if members wanted to expand their arguments, they will find the presiding officers very willing to assist them in that. So can I call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion. Deputy First Minister, 14 minutes or thereby. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this opportunity to open this debate on the steps that were taken to strengthen support for the development of new enterprises in Scotland. Um, there, uh, this is a, a fundamental area of policy for the Scottish Government, recognising the importance of ensuring that we create the strongest and the most vibrant climate for business development activity in our country. If we encourage more people to enter into business start-up and to encourage those businesses to grow, that can contribute significantly towards the realisation of the wider ambitions that the Government has to boost and to strengthen the performance of the Scottish economy and to create opportunities for all of our citizens to flourish through their participation within uh, the Scottish economy. The Scotland Can Do framework was published by the Government last year and it is a shared statement of our intent, along with our partners, towards Scotland becoming a world-leading entrepreneurial and innovative nation, essentially uh, a can-do place for business to take place. This is an ambitious framework, and I want to take this opportunity to update Parliament on the elements in place to make, to, in place to make sure that the vision that is contained within that shared statement of intent uh, across a range of different partners is transformed into a reality of stronger business growth in Scotland and a more emphatic economic performance as a result. The framework is ambitious, and I'll talk more about that ambition later. But I also want to emphasise that the Scotland Can Do framework is not just an ambition, but is an approach that draws on the very best our nation has to offer in terms of providing uh, the most sympathetic and supportive climate in which companies can do business. One clear example of the approach that the Government is taking is the action that was taken to establish the Scottish Edge Fund, a competition that makes awards of up to £100,000 to some of our country's most talented early-stage entrepreneurs. The concept was originally put to me by Jim Duffy of an organisation called Entrepreneurial Spark, who have a commendable track record of improving business performance and business start-up rates as a vehicle through which to give new and innovative companies a boost towards realising their goals and their economic opportunities. The real strength of the EDGE Fund is how it was taken forward in a committed partnership between the public sector represented by the Scottish Government and its enterprise agencies, the private sector represented by the Royal Bank of Scotland and the third sector represented by Entrepreneurial Spark. This collaborative approach has contributed to a vibrant, high-profile competition, which, since its launch at the end of 2012, has already made awards totalling over £3.3 million to 85 businesses in Scotland. In fact, winners from the first four rounds alone have gone on to create over 200 new jobs, generate an additional £8.5 million in turnover, and secure external funding um, of over £4.3 million £4.3 million, and not in considerable impact in such a short space of time. The purpose of this fund, and this point has been made to me very strongly by many of the people involved in this community, is that although the sums of money that are distributed towards individual companies may not seem like the largest sums of money, they are absolutely critical in the business development process in enabling people to take ideas from a, a stage of a, a conceptual stage to actually implementing business ideas and giving uh, new entrepreneurs some reasonable prospects that they can deliver greater financial performance as a consequence. So, Presiding Officer, I view the Scottish Edge Fund as an example 
of an area where the government is able to work collaboratively with its partners and, as a consequence, leave the, lay the foundations for a truly lasting legacy that supports uh, business development in Scotland. That is why, towards the end of last year, I agreed that management of the EDGE Fund would shift from our enterprise agencies into a new charitable company sponsored by the Hunter Foundation, led by Sir Tom Hunter. This will not only help to ensure a sustainable future for the EDGE Fund, but it will also ensure that it is truly owned by our partners in the business development ecosystem that we have been de determined to create. This ecosystem is another aspect of the approach that is encapsulated by the Scotland Can Do framework. Rather than individual organisations or initiatives being viewed or viewing themselves as the answer, our approach as a government is characterised by developing diverse partnerships, working collaboratively with other organisations to supply specific business needs. A good example of this is how government works in partnership with local authorities, supporting them to deliver business provision through Business Gateway to Scotland's start-ups, early stage and established businesses. Business Gateway helps to support over 10,000 start-ups a year and assists over 17,000 unique businesses. Business Gateway helps to support over 10,000 start-ups a year uh, uh, and with an, an estimated annual spend of £226 million in 2014. Local authorities play a key role in facilitating support for growth within this sector. This is an area where Scotland is particularly strong and will continue to strengthen our activities. Whether it be youth or female entrepreneurship, local or social enterprise or business innovation, Scotland has a growing wealth of support mechanisms to help realise the dreams of visionary companies and individuals. And one of the clear obligations that we place on all of the players within the system is that they must uh, operate in an integrated climate where there is support offered to individuals, whichever organisations they decide to support. And that is the principal concept that lies behind the business development ecosystem, where it can be where individual companies will be able to secure the necessary support that they require, regardless of where they go. And we place the onus on the different players in the business development ecosystem to work together cooperatively to make sure the needs of the business community are fully and adequately met. Now, that challenge um, is one that, in which the government continues to engage to guarantee that we have the necessary coordination and collaboration to make sure that businesses are not, in any sense of the word, passed from pillar to post, which would clearly be an undesirable and a debilitating sense for new emerging businesses. Uh, and I give the commitment to Parliament that we will look uh, readily at how we can ensure these different elements of the business development uh, support network are properly connected to meet the needs and the ambitions of the business community. I'd now like, presiding officer, to set out some of the areas where we as a government are helping to breed a culture of ambition, collaboration and innovation in relation to uh, different groups within uh, the population and different areas of activity. Um, first of all, in relation to supporting young people to develop the skills that they need to, to achieve their ambitions uh, is a central element of the approach to the government's agenda in this, uh, the, in this respect. Um, that is why we continue to work with a range of partners to ensure that the right support is available both within and beyond our education system to encourage more young people to consider entrepreneurship and um, establishing their own business as an option that they may wish to take forward. This is not... Uh, I'll certainly give way. John Mason. Uh, if I, if Way very much. Uh, I wonder if he feels that the young people in schools are being encouraged to consider entrepreneurship or having their own business, because it seems to me sometimes there's an emphasis in the schools, as I think in my case when I was at school, that you went and worked for a big organisation. Cabinet Secretary. I think that's. I, I, I certainly recognise the. Um, I'm not sure if Mr. Mason and I were in the school system at the same time, but I suspect we probably were. They're around about the same era, let me say it as generously as that, presiding officer. Um, I, and I certainly recognise the characteristic that he sets out at that time. I do think we are in a different place now.
because of a number of different measures that have taken place. Some of the work that our predecessors took forward through Determined to Succeed, which changed much of the climate within the school organisation about the interest in establishing businesses. A lot also to do with the fact that significant entrepreneurs in Scotland devote a lot of their time to actually leading the process of awareness raising within the schools uh, about this point. So I think, the, I think the situation is better uh, than it was, but obviously something that we must um, ensure is taken forward uh, in a more commanding way. So this approach um, is designed to ensure that young people are able to embrace the crucial characteristics that are essential in setting up uh, a, a business. And the work that the government has taken forward um, has been designed to support this through the wider application of the curriculum, but also the partnerships that exist uh, with entrepreneurs to raise awareness. Um, one of the other measures is by the partnerships that we uh, set up with organisations such as the Prince's Trust. And at the start of this year, I was pleased to announce over half a million pounds of support to the Prince's Trust for the purchase and the renovation of a new enterprise and employability hub in Glasgow. This facility, which is set to be the biggest of its kind in Scotland, will be a great resource for young people in the west of Scotland area and indeed for a very wide part of Scotland that will find this facility very readily accept, uh, accessible. The greatest resource, however, lies not just in the buildings that we put in place, but in the people that use them and the expertise and enthusiasm that they can bring to important tasks. For many years now, the Princess Trust has played a vital role in encouraging and supporting enterprise among Scotland's young people through the provision of funding, expert advice and mentoring. And I hope out of the sustained financial support the government has given to the organisation, we can see them continuing to, to, to build on that proud tradition in the years ahead. The second area where we are encouraging a greater focus on enterprise and entrepreneurship is within our colleges and universities, who play a vital role in providing timely support and encouragement. The Bridge to Business programme that we are supporting in Scotland's colleges, first piloted in 2013, is an initiative that aims to inspire, connect and support college students into business. Its impact is now being felt widely across Scotland's college network. It is also a great example of the collaborative Scotland Can Do approach that I have highlighted. For example, in recent months, Bridge to Business announced link-ups with both the Scottish Institute for Enterprise and the online marketplace ETSY. The former will give college students access to a broader network of support, including workshops and competitions. The latter will allow them to more easily test their business ideas in the real world. Young Enterprise Scotland deserve real credit for their innovative delivery of this exciting scheme. Our universities are also active participants in the interface model, which is designed to link um, academic ideas with the business community to encourage and to foster um, business startups. And I've seen in action a whole range of different organisations that have emerged as a consequence of all of that activity. Um, thirdly, female entrepreneurship is another priority area for improvement. A recent reminder of its importance was provided by research published by Professor Carter of Strathclyde University, the findings of which indicated that if women's participation in, inter in enterprise matched that of men's, it could boost our economy by around 5%. And I'm delighted that Professor Carter is now making a contribution to the First Minister's Council of Economic Advisers, where her uh, global leading research on entrepreneurship will be available for uh, the government to consider and to influence our framework. Now, if the ambitions and horizons that were set out by Professor Carter in her uh, research were translated into reality, that would equate to over 100,000 new businesses and an extra £7.6 billion to Scotland's GVA. So the, uh, the achievements that can be required uh, or could be delivered are significant if we are able to ensure that um, there is greater participation by women in the uh, culture of entrepreneurship. These are the reasons why the government supports the development of a Women Enterprise Action Framework, which we launched early last year in conjunction with Women's Enterprise Scotland. We are the only country in Europe that this, has this kind of collaborative policy framework to encourage women to enter entrepreneurship. 
But it is action that counts, and the document outlines a range of actions to help and encourage more women to set up and to succeed in business. Various partners from the ecosystem are helping with delivery, including the Royal Bank of Scotland, the Business Gateway and Cooperative Development Scotland. Another key initiative that we are supporting as a government is the development of a network of women's enterprise ambassadors. And already there are 15 ambassadors from a range of sectors and backgrounds helping to inspire and to encourage the next generation of significant female entrepreneurs within Scotland. Now, all of this activity fits into the wider economic framework that the government is taking forward. And at the heart of this, um, this work is the emphasis we place on innovation. As a key driver of productivity, it is essential that we deliver greater innovation to contribute towards the success of the Scottish economy. I believe that our innovation approach and the intent that we have shown by putting innovation at the very heart of our economic strategy is one of the key elements that will ensure that we have the right economic interventions in place. We intend to build on the strength of our universities um, whose um, excellence in research was further strengthened by the fact that the Research Excellence Framework last year found that each of Scotland's 18 inst higher education institutions undertakes world-leading research of significant quality and that the number of institutions and the proportion of their activity in the Research Excellence Framework has grown um, uh, into the bargain. We intend to build on the uh, innovative uh, contribution of key businesses such as Skyscanner, which is one of the fastest growing uh, businesses in the world, uh, based here in, the, in our capital city, but driven by a constant focus on innovation and productivity improvements, um, which we have seen in a number of different areas in the Scottish economy. That emphasis on innovation goes along with the other key pillar of our economic strategy, which is the necessity to encourage more companies to become involved in international market activity. Evidence shows that as businesses become more international, they also become more productive through exposure to new ideas, new technologies and new ways of working. A recent Scottish Enterprise Evaluation Report highlighted that companies that receive both innovation and internationalisation support report bigger impacts than those that receive one or neither. That is why through Scottish Development International we are working to support up to 10,000 more, bu more businesses across a range of sectors to develop the skills uh, to go international. And the, uh, the whole uh, focus of international connectivity is an essential part of encouraging more and more of the company base of Scotland uh, to become involved in higher value uh, productive activity. Um, let me uh, draw my remarks to a close with, 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 by commenting on one other area where we are extending this framework, the emphasis on enterprise and business development, the encouragement to, uh, to, to organisations to become more innovative, and that is to extend this message not just to the private sector business community, but also to the social enterprise community within Scotland. Um, the Scottish Government has placed a significant attention on the necessity of encouraging the development of a broader range of social enterprises who will actually be critical partners in ensuring that we tackle some of the inequality that exists within our society and encourages and motivates more individuals to become participants in the Scottish, in the Scottish economy. For example, the Social Entrepreneurs Fund that we've established plays a key role in developing new ideas that will support both our economy and the changing needs of our communities. This fund, which is delivered by Firstport, has already helped more than 280 individuals to set up and run a business with a social or an environmental purpose. Last year, I was pleased to be able to grant Social Investment Scotland the repayments made to loans made through the Scottish Investment Fund to provide match funding to create the Social Growth Fund into the bargain. This fund represents a substantial investment in and demonstrates our commitment to social enterprises. It will provide more support for social enterprises and community business in Scotland, making them much more self-sufficient and sustainable and help them to improve the lives of people within our communities. So the, the, one of the key aspects of the government's thinking is that we want to extend the reach of this innovative framework, not just to the private sector, but into the social enterprise community and to enable that sector to make the connections that are required to deliver success. Last week, uh, I had the pleasure of attending 
an event organised by Firstport, which was designed to connect social enterprises with some of the angel investment community within Scotland, who are focused on uh, ensuring they invest for long-term benefit um, of a financial, but also a social and economic nature into the bargain. And I was delighted to see so many of Scotland's angel investors willing to consider the opportunities that exist to invest in social enterprises and to support them into the bargain. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Scotland Can Do Framework represents an approach that cuts across all backgrounds and sectors and will, I hope, continue to generate the entrepreneurial success and innovative approach that allows Scotland's economy to thrive. We have brought together a range of expertise through this framework within the public, private and third sectors, which gives us the ability to uh, deliver very focused support to encourage more people to enter, to, to enter the world of business development and enterprise. And I look forward to sustaining this policy agenda and to the benefits that will accrue as a consequence. On that basis, I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. <coughs> and I now call Murdo Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 13338.1, 12 minutes or so. Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by welcoming this debate this afternoon on Scotland Can Do? It's clear there's much to be done to raise the level of entrepreneurship in Scotland, and the amendment I've lodged to the motion to make some reference to this challenge. But before I turn to the detail of that, I think it's important to set out the economic backdrop to our current situation. We are seeing good economic progress in Scotland after a difficult and turbulent period. The economy continues to grow strongly, and the projections are that this will continue. Employment is at record levels. Unemployment is still on a downward trend, and youth unemployment and the claimant count is today at its lowest since 2008. The tough decisions taken by the previous Westminster Government have paid off, and the new Conservative Government will continue on the path that has helped deliver economic success. The nature of the economy and the employment market is changing. So we have seen fewer public sector jobs, but more jobs created in the private sector. Since 2010, nearly 127,000 new private sector jobs have been created in Scotland, bringing us close to a near record high of over 2 million. And some 35,000 new businesses have been created over the past five years. So we are seeing some progress in the right direction. But there is much more to do. According to the Office for National Statistics, in each year from 2011 to 2013, Scotland accounted for 7% of the UK's businesses below our population share. And Scotland has a below average rate of business birth. According to the Scottish Government's own statistics, in 2013, Scotland had 49 new business registrations per 10,000 of adult population in comparison to a UK figure of 67. And if we take London out of the picture, then the UK figure would be 58 per 10,000 resident adults. So we still lag behind even that. So while we are getting better, we have still some way to go to match the UK average, or even the UK figure if we exclude London. And I think it's important that we set in context the very good work that is ongoing and that the Deputy First Minister referred to in his opening remarks. Now, it's not just the uh, Scottish Government's own statistics which highlight uh, the issue. The uh, recently published uh, report by the Enterprise Research Centre on benchmarking local innovation, the innovation geography of the UK, shows that in amongst uh, parts of the United Kingdom, the three areas that have the weakest innovation performance overall are Eastern Scotland, Northern Ireland and Cumbria. And across a whole range of measures, including product and service innovation, new to the market innovation, process innovation, strategic and marketing innovation, research and development and collaboration. Scotland is consistently towards the lower end of the table, according uh, to this study. And it's interesting, if you look at the most successful areas, they tend to be in central and southern England, and clusters around Cambridge and around Oxfordshire are showing uh, the greatest success. But even in the north of England, uh, the Tees Valley is the best performing of northern local economic areas, and generally speaking, doing better than Scotland is. So it's not just in terms of the bare statistics uh, that we're not doing as well as we should. According to these independent uh, academic reports, we are lagging behind other parts 
of the United Kingdom. And I think what would be interesting to know, and perhaps the, the Deputy First Minister could address this in his winding up, is if the Scottish Government has done any recent research into why we perform relatively poorly. Now, it's perhaps easy to see why our figures lag London, one of the great cities of the world with a dynamic, fast-moving economy. But we are still performing worse than the average in other parts of the United Kingdom. And we'll have, all have our own ideas as to why this should be. The Scottish economy traditionally has had a different structure with a larger public sector than elsewhere in the UK. We may have different cultural attitudes towards risk-taking than other parts. But before we can properly devise measures to close the gap, which must be our ambition, we need to understand the reasons for our historic poor performance. There are three national indicators on performance to help us measure progress towards becoming a world-leading entrepreneurial and innovative nation. First, there is the aim to increase the number of businesses in Scotland, and we've heard the statistics on these. Secondly, an ambition to increase spending on research and development. And while this did increase in the period from 2006 to 2013, from 1.35 per cent of GDP to 1.55 per cent, that increase has been lower than the rate in the, UK, in the EU as a whole, meaning that the gap between Scotland and the rest of the EU has actually increased and we've fallen further behind. And third, there is an ambition to improve knowledge exchange from university uh, research. Now, all these indicators show us how much more work there needs to be done. And in that context, the Scotland uh, Can Do uh, project, uh, the Scottish Government's Enterprise and Innovation Strategy, is a welcome set of measures. And the whole range of initiatives which have been outlined, some, some by the Deputy First Minister this afternoon, that we would warmly welcome. He referenced, for example, the Scottish uh, Edge Fund, which grew out of the Entrepreneurial Spark programme headed by uh, Jim Duffy. I know uh, from having spoken to people involved in that programme what great value it is to budding entrepreneurs who very much uh, appreciate, in particular, the experience mentoring and the provision of peer-to-peer -peer support from those who have experience. And it's also very welcome that that is uh, supported by the Royal Bank of Scotland, who have a particular uh, ability, of course, to help provide finance for those who are looking to start up uh, new businesses. Now, the Deputy First Minister referred to the work of public agencies. In the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, we're always keen to scrutinise the work done by public agencies and look at their focus on improving entrepreneurship. And the feedback we have about agencies such as Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise tends to be very positive from account-managed companies. But I think there remains an issue as to whether we have the right level of support for companies which do not meet the criteria for account management? Is Business Gateway providing the right level of support for everyone else? Do we see the aligned and focused business support to improve entrepreneurial and innovative capabilities that the can-do document refers to? Do we see enough support for entrepreneurs and innovative businesses enabling them to work in the digital economy? The report also refers to access to finance. And while the situation may be improving slowly with the overall improvement in the economy, it is clear this is still a major barrier to business expansion. What we are seeing, as the committee found out last year, is companies resorting to more innovative approaches such as crowdfunding or angel investors in order to raise the capital that they need. But this is still an area where serious attention is required. The Action Framework makes reference to the need to grow exports. I would commend to members the recent report from the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee on internationalising Scottish business and specifically our recommendations. There is a lot of good work ongoing, but still too few of our businesses are exporting, and these in too limited a number of sectors. Scottish Development International, as the lead agency, is doing good work and is highly regarded by those who benefit from its services. But is it doing enough to reach those who have the potential to export and do not currently do so. And the committee also found that there is a need for a single portal for businesses needing advice on exporting, with a sense that we still have too cluttered a landscape and, in some areas, a necessary duplication of effort. We felt that SDI were the public agency best placed to lead this work in Scotland, having a coordinating role with the others involved and also having full engagement with the private sector. These are all areas that need attention, 
But I do think the most significant part of this strategy will be in changing culture. Because we do need to promote entrepreneurship and innovation at all levels of education, from schools through to colleges and universities. Every student at further or higher education should have some access to entrepreneurship training. Because we are very good in Scotland at producing ideas, and where we tend to fall down is translating these into wealth creating businesses. The University of Scotland briefing for this debate has a lot more to say in relation to some of these ideas, and if I have time in my closing remarks, I'll turn to some of these uh, later in the debate. But it's absolutely right to say that we need role models to inspire young people in entrepreneurship and innovation. Television programmes like The Apprentice or Dragon's Den might provide good entertainment, but they don't always provide the most positive view of the business world. Deputy Presiding Officer, the can-do strategy has a long list of strands of work being taken forward. These are all worthy, and it is probably the case that there is no silver bullet which can deliver the growth and entrepreneurship that we all want to see. So I hope that the current strategy will deliver greater growth in entrepreneurship, and I hope that we can all share the ambition that we can make Scotland at least as entrepreneurial a nation as our neighbours elsewhere in the United Kingdom. I'm pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, just remind the Chamber that we do have time available in this debate. Um, I call on Graham Pearson, 10 minutes or so. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you for allowing me to contribute to this afternoon's debate. Uh, first of all, can I commend all those who are involved in business across Scotland and the entrepreneurs, many of whom operate unseen across the landward areas, towns and cities of our country committed to creating the very economy that we discuss today. Those in the private sector, the agencies and the third sector commitments eh, do a, a grand service on our behalf and in that endeavour, eh, the government commitment to entrepreneurship and innovation is welcomed by those on this side of the chamber and will be supported in any real actions it takes to deliver on the stated aims of Scotland can do. In consideration of those aims, we should nevertheless identify the context within which they operate. Enterprise and entrepreneurial endeavour are not of themselves virtuous outcomes. The pursuit of profit is a necessary part of any business enterprise. But at the same time, employees, customers and the wider community should feel the benefits delivered by business in the round. Scotland and the wider UK economies are beginning to move forward, but the benefits are currently fragile and tentative at this stage and reliant on a world economy still recovering from the global economic crash mentioned earlier. I am happy to. John Mason. I mean, the member talks about uh, entrepreneurship and the importance that any benefits be shared around and the profits don't just appear in one place. So would he also agree that uh, the ownership of new enterprises like a cooperative model, employee ownership, are also p part of the answer here? Graham Pearson. I'm pleased to acknowledge that uh, all approaches to entrepreneurial uh, benefit and business development uh, has a benefit for wider com communities if properly managed and, and properly utilised. Um, the Industrial Communities Alliance reported in March 2015 the upturn in economic growth is already leaving older industrial Britain behind, as they describe it. The impact for Scotland's communities affects 17 areas across the country, including the West Coast, the Ayrshires, the Central Belt, including Glasgow, up through Fife, and many other parts of, of our nation. Private sector employment during the period 2009-13 saw the British uh, employment uh, indices rise by 3.4 per cent, whereas in the older industrial areas it was recorded at 0.9 per cent. The average British claimant rate in terms of benefit support was 10.3 per cent. In the older industrial areas of Scotland, it was recorded at 15.4 per cent. These factors taken together with the growth of zero-hour contracts, part-time working, has for many families reduced their opportunity to play a part in the economic lives of their community. No access to mortgages, to credit, an absence of dependable earnings for future 
acts to disable whole groups of our society for a generation and beyond. But what to do in a global market where substantial parts uh, we identify as Scottish are actually owned and controlled outside this country? Our fish, our spirits industry, our power industry, engineering, oil and gas are all substantially operated by overseas companies. Although located here, because of our environmental opportunities, our relatively stable society, our workforces, education and expertise, transnational companies strive to make profits quite properly, but nations complete compete internationally in the desire to succeed and to prosper by attracting such industries to the doorstep. For some companies, that attraction to locate can be quickly undone to the detriment of dependent communities. We do nevertheless have terrific advantages. Our environment, our education system, the quality of our people, our commitment to innovation, our ability to adapt, all contribute to offering the opportunity for success in a small, well-connected nation capable of dealing with change. We also benefit from our membership of the EU, both in terms of direct funding from the EU itself, but more importantly, from access to a single market. We must continue to put the positive case for EU membership in the run-up to the EU referendum, whenever that might be. But that success is not a gift for the taking. It needs hard work, focus, engagement from all sectors of our communities and public authorities. It requires vision, leadership and a hunger to succeed against the ever-changing challenges globally from emerging nations on the capitalist scene such as China, India, Mexico, Turkey and shortly the, Amer the American nations. Whilst the so-called BRIC economies may not have lived up to the more over-the-top hype of the last few years, emerging economies are markets with unparalleled potential. It is remarkable that China's 7.4 per cent GDP growth in 2014 was regarded by some as sluggish. Entrepreneurs and investors must be helped to access these markets. The creation of enterprise and the growth in numbers of entrepreneurs Critical to, to government is very much the business of the private sector, but governments can do more, and importantly, they can encourage success. What can we expect the Scottish Government to do? Increase its commitment to ensure all of our young people, particularly in deprived areas, gain access to university and see an opportunity for the future, and report on the progress that is achieved there. The number of young people from the poorest parts of Scotland attending our ancient universities continue to be effectively stagnant. Official figures for 2013-14 show that 196 uh, students of 810 undergraduates accepted to study at Scotland's five medical schools were from private schools. What does this mean for people from the most deprived areas of Scotland? As chances uh, of getting into biomedical sciences are a key area of our growth. I am happy to take the Dennis Robertson. Uh, I thank the member for taking the intervention. The member uh, also acknowledged that university is not the only route to success for entrepreneurism. And obviously, a lot of young people with many, many, many diverse talents may seek a different pathway. Graeme Pearson. I, of course, acknowledge that and hope to come on to that point later on. Uh, we should, our Scottish Government should encourage universities to work even more closely with business to ensure that students are taught uh, in the tertiary education not only uh, the business interests but understand how to sell ideas as they go about developing businesses. Increase access by business and employers to schools from primary school onwards to develop effective mentoring and a wider knowledge of entrepreneurial skill sets and measure the results that are achieved there. Encourage and support initiatives like Entrepreneurial Spark that already report impressive outcomes for their work, particularly the 82.3 per cent success rate of companies worked with eSpark who are still trading today. 
make the most of EU UK regional development funds to maximise their impact on the older industrial areas, encourage regional selective uh, assistance. At primary school and onwards, promote students' involvement in engineering, building and skills apprenticeships. As mentioned by Mr Robertson earlier, university is not always the way forward in entrepreneurial development. Commit to Erasmus, the EU initiative designed to involve Scottish young people in the wider European experience. Deliver a standard simplified and a framework procurement process for all public authorities designed to focus not solely on value for money in terms of the lowest price, but consider quality and community impacts to encourage local business developments and again smart working. Redesign the planning environment to deliver timely and the, response, the responses to business needs whilst balancing community interests. And revisit the concept of city and town centres to address the evident decline affecting so many of our town centres and engage with retailers and businesses particularly in having a greater influence on how development plans can be actioned for the future for instance, in the management of traffic and parking conditions. Commit to target-driven delivery of public Wi-Fi in our town centres and, of course, the fast-speed broadband that have been discussed in this chamber previously and encourage the development of crowdfunding initiatives across Scotland, already growing at twice the rate of any other business in Scotland, doubling its business year-on-year year in the last three years and deliver on energy security, so important to many of our main businesses. Government should deliver uh, in reducing the unpredictability of policy outcomes. Business enjoys dependability and seeks to be able to plan in a, an environment that they know what is to happen. And they complain about the obscure gov governmental language which describes policy intentions. Look to initiating substantial public projects designed to offer employment locally, better to build for a future need employing our people than pay benefits for unemployment, and create substantial work to protect intellectual property rights for those entrepreneurs that currently we don't even know about, but who will develop the ideas for the future, which can be removed from their possession as profits go elsewhere in the world. There is much that the government can do to enable small business federation and chambers of commerce to, and tap into their practical knowledge at local level in developing ideas for the future, as well as investing in training, education and developing genuine entrepreneurial skills and develop a commitment to manufacturing products here in Scotland. In the last six months, as I've travelled the country speaking to those in business, I've been shocked at the numbers of uh, machines that are used in our factories and our productions, all of which almost exclusively come from Germany, Switzerland and Austria. Scotland led the way in developing machines in a previous industrial revolution. We have the skills to develop the same ex expertise for the future, and it's important that we should. The government should develop and show its ability to listen to inconvenient messages from those engaged in entrepreneurial pursuits. And although I welcome the can-do action plan and will support the motion at the end of this debate, I trust that the government realises it doesn't know everything that it should know currently and needs to develop a listening ear and action those things that they hear. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And we now turn to the open debate this afternoon. I can allow speeches of seven minutes or so. I still have a little bit of time for interventions. I call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, John Swinney began by saying that this government's Scotland Can Do framework is ambitious. And I'm glad because Scotland should have ambition. Uh, we have much to be ambitious about. We've got a strong track record, historical and current, of entrepreneurship and innovation. 
That's both individuals and companies. And of course, we have our greatest asset, our people. So, the can-do framework recognises the great strengths and opportunities our nation has and clearly sets out the areas for collaborative action. We recognise, of course, um, the key role that entrepreneurial activity plays in delivering sustainable economic growth. And I think it's very important that we look at um, our strengths and our weaknesses in that regard, because there are some things that are not as good as they could be. And one of the things I would quote in that is the number of women entrepreneurs, and that was mentioned by John Swinney. But how, if we were able to match the number of men in entrepreneurial uh, fields of work, we could gen generate a lot more for the economy. And it was interesting to see that research from the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship at Strathclyde University indicated that if women's participation rates matched that of men's, it could in fact boost the economy by as much as 5%. And so I'm pleased that the Scottish Government announced in March an investment of £85,000 in Women's Enterprise Scotland to take forward actions in the framework. And it is the case that female self-employment is increasing. That, that's all great to talk about additional jobs, additional entrepreneurship and more people in work. But of course, we've always got to look at the effects of that. And for me, the, the most important, the key word in all of this is sustainable. And for me, that means joined up thinking and it means objectives other than merely growing the economy. For example, fair work. I think fair work is absolutely key to this. And again, I'm pleased that in tandem with the entrepreneurial initiatives that have been announced, we also have the Fair Work Convention. And the Fair Work Convention is to provide independent advice to the Scottish Government on matters relating um, to workplaces, industrial relations, fair work, the living wage. And it's all about the bigger picture, which, which is the objectives to reduce inequality, promote diversity and equality, and, of course, increase that sustainable economic growth to the benefit of the country for all. And I'm pleased that the initial task of the Fair Work Convention is developing, uh, promoting and sustaining fair employment and a good framework for Scotland in that. So these things complement each other. Something else for me that's key is social responsibility. And that can take many forms, uh, both at home and, of course, in other countries. And uh, my own uh, constituency of East Kilbride has many, many examples of this. Can I mention, for example, Optical Express, which, as the uh, member for Hamilton sitting beside me um, would ask me to point out, also has a branch in Hamilton. And Christina is wearing some of their spectacles. <laughs> so Optical Express do that work at home. But also, in tandem with that, as Sighted International, they operate eye clinics in Kenya and Malawi. So very important. So it's about uh, global responsibility and citizenship. We also have Deliver Next Day Personally, which is a, a courier service started by businessman Bruce Gunn, providing work for those with disabilities and proving to be an extremely efficient and competitive company. Klansman Dynamics, Robotic Engineering, East Cobride, a company which, since moving to an employee ownership model, has gone from strength to strength. The last one that I'll mention in this regard, some years ago, East Cobride lad Mick Jackson had the Business for Good vision and uh, Wild Hearts, through Microtyke, etc. His company, Wild Hearts, has passed on entrepreneurial skills and related social responsibility to school children in East Cobride, in Scotland and across the world. So that, that brings me to what I think is absolutely key for this, the final key, and that's young people. I'm, again, I'm pleased uh, that the Scottish Government's providing money to support the delivery of the Young Innovators Challenge, which awards cash prizes to young entrepreneurs that develop from life-changing ideas. Because entrepreneurship among young people is not as high in our country as it should be, and, and that has been covered earlier by others as well. They are capable of so very much. I am constantly impressed by the young people in the schools in my own town of East Kilbride, both at primary level and at senior school level. 
And then beyond that, during apprenticeship week, when I was in East Kilbride Group Training Association, again, the skills that were apparent from young people who had left school and decided to go for apprenticeships in engineering, the skills were immeasurable that they were showing. And also, um, the ideas that they had about what they would do once they were qualified. And so much is all about ideas. And I'm pleased that uh, tomorrow there's the... No, it's not tomorrow at all, it's Friday. Sorry, presiding officer. On Friday, there's the Gopher Set finals. Gopher Set, the engineering finals every year that run for schools. is taking place this Friday in Edinburgh. And uh, yet again, there's an East Kilbride School in the final, uh, Calder Glen High School. And over the years, I've been so impressed at the ideas and then the skills that the young people from these schools right across Scotland have used to put together the environmental engineering schemes. So good luck to Calder Glen High School on Friday. So, presiding officer, we have the skills, we have the resource, and uh, I believe that we actually jointly have the will and the motivation to succeed. So I support the motion. I think it's good that we have a framework that states quite clearly that indeed Scotland can do. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Margaret McDougall to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, presiding officer. I welcome this opportunity to take part in today's debate, Scotland Can Do, a framework for entrepreneurship and innovation. I am going to focus my time on the work of Jim Duffy's Entrepreneurial Spark, already mentioned by Mr Swinney and Myrtle Fraser, which operates within Ayrshire and right across Scotland. It's also a partner within the Scotland Can Do framework. Entrepreneurial Spark is an organisation which started in Scotland and has recently begun to expand their model to the rest of the UK, with eight hatcheries, as they are known, opening across the UK. Birmingham was launched in February, while Bristol, Leeds, Brighton will open in August. The remainder of the locations will be announced over the next 18 months. This is great news for Entrepreneurial Spark, given they only started three years ago, and so far they have supported over 352 companies who have went on to collectively turn over just over £41 million in profit and created 1,028 jobs. In Ayrshire alone, they have supported over 40 businesses, and today I'm going to focus on three very different examples. Birth Sparks Limited, Crucial Drinks and Planted Money. These examples will not only show the kind of work Entrepreneurial Spark do, but also the ways in which they support, this support can really make a difference to people's lives and their company's aspirations. Birth Sparks Limited was created by Cass McTamara. The company designs comfortable, upright birth support a new innovation that promotes safer, healthier births for mothers and babies. Entrepreneurial Spark offered this, the company support in a proactive manner, giving Cass confidence, contacts and opportunities that she would not have obtained on her own. Since getting assistance from Entrepreneurial Spark, the company has won the EDGE Award, the Global Ambition Award, and created three full-time jobs and has a turnover of £260,000. Birth Sparks now has plans to open a distribution centre in Ayrshire. This example goes to show that when the right idea has the right support, people can and do succeed. The second company, set up by Scott Watson, is Crucial Drinks, a business which currently trades under the brand's the Lost Distillery Company, which is whisky, Six Saints Rum, and West Indies Rum and Cane Merchants. They applied to Entrepreneurial Spark because they wanted a risk-free environment that would coach them in starting a business from scratch while gaining them new contacts. Entrepreneurial Spark helped in not only getting the idea off the ground, but also in giving Scott the confidence he needed 
to leap into the unknown and actually pursue his idea, committing to a plan and a go-do. It helped remove the clutter of the business world, allowing Crucial Drinks to take every step in achievable bite-sized chunks. This support has led to Crucial Drinks now selling over 20 trademark brands and achieving over £1 million in turnover. It's fair to say that without the essential support, this business idea may well have remained just an idea. The final business, Plant It Money, is a fairly recent start-up and Kyle MacDonald launched its website and mobile app officially in February of this year. It is a financial technology company which simplifies financial planning and money management. The support provided by Entrepreneurial Spark was invaluable as it not only allowed them to gain a key understanding of how to launch a product and improve customer relations, but provided them with the key insight into the banking sector as Entrepreneurial Park, Spark have a partnership with the Royal Bank of Scotland. They have already won an award as a company with high growth potential as Entrepreneurial Spark's 2014 Business Awards. And I would like to wish them every success in their endeavours and hope that they find the same success as the two previous companies I have mentioned. This is just a few examples to show what vital support can mean to people and their entrepreneurial ambitions. It's crucial that startup businesses are supported and organisations are on hand to cut through the minefield of the business world. It is concerning to me that Scotland lags behind the rest of the UK in business startups, with only 49 new business registrations per 10,000 of the adult population in 2013. We need to up our game, and organisations like Entrepreneurial Spark play a big role in that. Presiding Officer, Scotland can do when we all work together and properly support startup businesses. Entrepreneurial Spark is only one example of this, and many of the businesses it has supported may not have made it on their own. It's important that we encourage and develop ideas to become reality. People succeed when they are provided with the confidence to do so, and it's crucial we support organisations that assist in doing this. I particularly welcome the Deputy First Minister's encouraging words and funding to support more women entrepreneurs to realise their ambitions in business. Right now, presiding officer, as we have already heard, Scotland is behind the UK average in terms of business start-ups. I don't want to see Scotland reach the UK average. I want to see Scotland surpass it and I know with the proper support and investment, Scotland can do it. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Uh, presiding officer, there's at least one civil servant is uh, due some congratulations from us all. Um, finding uh, can do out of capable, ambitious, networked, demand and opportunities is a pretty neat way of capturing uh, uh, the, the whole thing. Uh, working computers as I have uh, for many, many decades, uh, we used to do this all the time and it used to be the greatest fun we had. Now, I want to uh, talk about a rather eclectic subject, but it is one that is utterly uh, relevant to the topic of today's debate. And it is about one of the threats that comes from one of the bills uh, that is being brought forward uh, in the Queen's speech uh, last week. I specifically refer to the Investigatory Powers Bill, uh, which the Tory government uh, proposes. And within that, the key proposal uh, is a requirement for a backdoor in software that would enable the security services to read the content of private messages protected by encryption. Now, that sounds all very geekish, and in many ways it actually is, but it really does matter. Now, let me acknowledge that, of course, terrorism is uh, a very important part of the threats to business throughout the world and to people's lives across the world, and we need to respond to that in an appropriate way. 
But if we are going to continue to be, as the motion says, a can-do place for business, the core, the proposal in the Investigatory Powers Bill uh, simply can't proceed. Let me just make a few points. If you've got to protect messages, and I'll talk about the kind of messages we need to protect, uh, then opening up the software that protects messages so that some people have privilege access to read it uh, is going to create a whole series of difficulties. First of all, the lawbreakers simply won't use software that has backdoors. They'll write their own, so it won't actually particularly affect those who choose to break the law and conceal the content of the messages. It will affect those who are obeying the law. Those uh, with evil intent will be unaffected. But secondly, more critically, uh, it will open up all our financial transactions to open scrutiny and potentially uh, interference because if you've got a way in, that way in will become a way in for lots of people. Now, why does that matter for Scotland and entrepreneurs in Scotland? Well, it does matter and it matters differentially because we are a leading source of innovative software for the financial sector. And Margaret McDougall has just referred uh, to innovative software uh, the, in, in her remarks. Well, that kind of software in future, under that kind of regime that's proposed to be introduced, might not be produced here. We have a significant interest in producing secure banking software, but if it can't be developed here, then it will be developed elsewhere. Um, we had reference uh, to Skyscanner, uh, and Skyscanner, depends for the integrity of the transaction between it and customers worldwide. Not just on that little um, padlock that appears in the top line of your browser. Behind that is software that protects the integrity of communication between Skycanner and customers. The opening up through this bill proposed by the Tories in the Queen's speech will damage the integrity of that protection. And this isn't just theoretical. Already in the United States, Phil Zimmerman, the creator of the world's most widely used email uh, protection system, which is called Pretty Good Privacy, otherwise known as PGP, has already started to move his company to Switzerland because the United States government is doing uh, something similar. And if legislation proceeds in this way, high-tech, high-value contributors uh, to our being what the motion refers to as entrepreneurial and innovative nation will simply depart. And it's quite easy to do because these are not people with fixed assets here, big factories. The intellectual skills in their people are what can move and they can move tomorrow without any substantial uh, difficulty. Now, you, you, you have to accept too. Now, once you create a backdoor, it, the knowledge of the backdoor is supposed to be to the security services, but to lots of people in the security services, inevitably will leak. The most secure software is always open source software where everyone can look at the algorithm and improve it. The secrecy is in the key, a unique piece of information held by a single person. Uh, the operation and algorithms of backdoors will inevitably uh, be bypassable. If they're thought to be secret, they'll soon be disclosed. Now, none of this is actually new. Uh, Napoleon's Peninsular War campaign uh, was undermined by Wellington's cryptologist, uh, George Scoville. Uh, he was able to read the intercepted and encrypted orders to the French troops uh, rapidly and routinely. And of course, Napoleon lost the war because that was able uh, to happen. And each generation uh, moves on to new methods of protecting information. In World War I, the Cherokees and the Choctaw Indian tribes were used over the radio because nobody could understand what their languages said. And in the Second World War, the Navajo, the Lakato, the Miskawi, and the Comanche, and even Basques were used to protect information. So the need to protect information in sensitive environments is nothing new whatsoever. Now, the UK lost out a key opportunity. Uh, we've all got a little token that we use for accessing the Parliament's websites and facilities, and it's got the words, the letters RSA on it that we use, and that's Revest, Shamir, and Edelman. 
American mathematicians who developed a very secure way of communicating. But of course, 30 years ago, this piece of paper, a single sheet of A4, was a secret document, only became, came to light 10 years ago, which shows that nearly 10 years before Rivesh, Shamir, and Edelman developed the system, GCHQ and its predecessors were already developing it. We lost the commercial opportunity uh, in the UK, and now the USA uh, control things. It's important that innovation is not stifled by legislators simply not understanding the importance of and manners of working uh, that there are uh, for uh, technology. Uh, now, if we were to proceed with the proposal in the Queen's speech, we will no longer be as secure in our banking and communication as we currently are. And that is a huge risk. Migration of services will inevitably take place as is already uh, beginning to happen in the United States. It will damage a key sector of the economy, of the UK as a whole, but differentially for Scotland, it is even more important. So I hope that the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, will think about this and his officials will think about this, that we'll be able to work all the parties here with colleagues at Westminster to make sure that this does not happen. I'm disappointed the Liberals are not with us today because I know that they are sensitive to this and will be uh, on side for helping oppose this particular uh, so-called innovation uh, to protect us from uh, terrorism. It won't do that, but it will damage business if it goes ahead in the form proposed, and I hope that we will all oppose it. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. I now call Roger Campbell to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's always a challenge to follow uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, I'm certainly not going to be talking about investigatory powers, snoopers, charters. I was going to start with a note of history, but uh, uh, Mr. Stevenson has already taken us back to the era of Napoleon, so I'm a wee bit snookered on that. But nevertheless, I, I shall start. Scotland is, of course, the birthplace of Alexander Graham Bell, of Alexander Fleming and James Watt and is no stranger to innovation. The challenge, of course, is to turn innovators into entrepreneurs. The can-do framework recognizes the strengths and opportunities our nation has. Linda Fabiani has talked of the need to increase the number of women entrepreneurs, but we also need particularly to encourage the young. Of course, our schools, colleges, and universities have an important role to play in encouraging the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. But youth unemployment rates, while now at their lowest level since 2008, are still too high. And self-employment rates for under 34s, a key group for innovators and new enterprises, are still some way behind older workers. So encouragement is needed. The Prince's Scottish Youth Business Trust, established earlier this year following the merger of the Prince's Trust and Youth Business Scotland, does an excellent job in providing support to young people looking to start and grow their own businesses. But more can be done, however. For example, by the introduction of Explore Enterprise courses in Scotland. Currently, the nearest four-day course for aspiring entrepreneurs in Scotland is in Berwick-on-Tweed. Wales and Northern Ireland, on the other hand, will be home to five and, such, and, five and seven such courses, respectively. So I, for one, would welcome a, a, an attempt to uh, have some of those courses a bit nearer to home. On a more positive note, the provision of a 205,000 grant from uh, the Scottish Government to support the Young Innovators Challenge as part of Scotland Can Do is welcome, as Linda Fabian has already mentioned. It's just one way in which future generations of entrepreneurs are being supported in Scotland. The 2015 theme of the Young Innovators Challenge is social innovation and entries that could address problems and create opportunities related to healthcare and well-being, low carbon and sustainability, and smarter communities are invited. Emphasised throughout the document is smart, sustainable and inclusive growth, with a hope that will accelerate Scotland's ambition to be a world-leading entrepreneurial and innovative nation. The Horizon 2020 programme, of course, emphasises the need for sustainable development. Presiding officer, there is nowhere is innovation and the pursuit of sustainable growth more ably displayed than at the University of St Andrews, which continues to make a profound impact on innovative new projects every academic year and undoubtedly provides a significant influence on some of its students. In 2013, research into the use of a tractor beam until then, nothing more than a fantastical idea from the mind of Gene Roddenberry, brought to life by the film and TV series of Star Trek, beloved of Rosanna Cunningham, 
uh, was led by academics in St Andrews, and the, the, who's uh, not with us today, um, but uh, with us in spirit, probably. Um, the physics department at the university also recently opened the doors to its brand new, unique state-of-the-art research laboratory that will allow it to conduct further work into the use of lasers and the study of individual atoms. Elsewhere at the university, the biology department and the Sea Mammal Research Unit has led the way in research into the world's oceans and the behaviour of some sea ma mammals through the tagging and tracking of harbour seals. It's this kind of work that sets St Andrews apart in Scotland as being the home of some of the most groundbreaking scientific research. But Scotland, of course, has a key role to play in research, and it's really pleasing that according to the Research Excellence Framework published in December, all Scotland's universities are undertaking world-leading research. It should not be the case, however, that Scotland's universities work independently from the business sector when it comes to research and innovation. There's a great deal of collaboration that took, can take place between the two sectors. Again, St Andrews is leading the way on this front, with the forthcoming 25 million energy eco-hub at Guard Bridge, which could one day be home to re new renewable technologies and training opportunities. The potential for the university's Guard Bridge site has not yet been fully tapped, but I'm delighted that the Scottish Government, together with the European Regional Development Fund, has invested in it to the tune of £11 million worth of funding for the project. It's this type of potential collaboration between our universities and our business community that will engender new links and new opportunities for future generations of Scotland's workforce and provide fresh and exciting opportunities for aspiring entrepreneurs. North East Fife is, of course, no stranger to entrepreneurialism, Dozens of sole trading firms or small businesses are flourishing in the rural economy, courtesy of not least superfast broadband connectivity. But we must encourage superfast broadband everywhere. Without that connectivity, opportunities for innovation and for budding entrepreneurs will undoubtedly be diminished. The provision of suitable facilities from which to trade is also essential to success for entrepreneurs, which is why the Fresh Start scheme is also important. Of course, we can point to an increase in the number of businesses in Scotland, even if, as Murdo Fraser has pointed out, the number of business startups has not caught up with the rest of the UK. And I too would be interested to hear comments from uh, the Cabinet Secretary on that in his uh, closing speech. But uh, Business Gateway fulfills a valuable role supporting 10,000 startup businesses every year. Hopefully, the banks will provide funding more readily in the future. That's an essential for entrepreneurs. It's hopeful that they will provide more funding than they've done in the past, but there are early signs, according to the press, that things are easing. The Scottish Government is playing its part through the development of the Scottish Investment Bank. And let's not forget the importance of the small business bonus, a lifeline for many new businesses whilst they get up and running. And I'm delighted by the First Minister's commitment to that in the next Parliament, should this Government be re-elected. While the powers contained within the Community Empowerment Bill to give local authorities new powers to create local business rate relief schemes to meet local priorities is much welcomed. Presiding Officer Scotland can do because it already does. The potential exists to do much more, however. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I take the opportunity to express my pleasure in taking part in this important debate this afternoon. The Scotland Can Do framework was launched to set out areas of priority in which the Scottish Government can act to see that Scotland becomes a world-leading and innovative nation for business. It is only right that we commend the work of the stakeholders who have co contributed to this framework so far and the many issues that have been raised should further instruct the Scottish Government as it sets out to achieve the aims of this report. Presiding officer, it is clear to me that underpinning this need for further innovation, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship is the importance of staying part of the European Union. As part of the EU's SPART specialisation platform, Scotland is able to promote focus on areas within the country that provide unique competitive advantage, which, given the distinctive nature of some of our Scottish businesses, is crucial in allowing those companies to flourish in the global marketplace. 
Scotland, of course, has always had a tradition of innovation and skill in business. As a nation, we have produced world-class entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers, and can lay claim to having invented the modern world. These past achievements should rightly be celebrated, but more importantly, current successes such as the development of the next generation's prosthetic limbs by Touch Bionics and Alexander Dennis Limited hybrid buses are at the forefront of research and development in the world today. Equally important is the recognition that it will be this kind of research and development funding and work which will provide Scotland with a 21st century economy and deliver employment in areas not yet created. However, there are many challenges to be overcome if Scotland is to reach its full potential. Skills for growth, sales and technology were all identified as underdeveloped by the Scottish Government's report. So to securing appropriate finance for many growing businesses. I welcome the involvement of organisations such as Interface, who have introduced over 1,800 businesses to academic partners over the last few years. And I also welcome the work of Scotland's universities, who work with 19,000 Scottish businesses every year, but acknowledge that this must be built upon. In closing, President Officer, I believe Scotland's attitude to entrepreneurship has to evolve. We require further inclusion in schools, further education and across society increase awareness of the opportunities starting to own business can provide. We need to see an increase in collaboration between our public, private and third sectors, strengthening each sector as we move towards a highly skilled, highly waged economy. And crucially, we need to ensure that people are encouraged from all walks of life to become entrepreneurs and start their own businesses. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to have this debate this afternoon about the future of Scot Scottish business. I commend the government on its efforts so far, whilst acknowledging that there is still much work to be done. We need to see continued increases in research and development funding, further support in finance for growing businesses and provision of adequate places, particularly in further education, in order to train and upskill the entrepreneurs of the future. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Mark MacDonald to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I speak in this debate um, from the perspective of somebody whose uh, father in um, 1998 uh, took the decision with one of his fellow employees at a company to uh, go and start up their own company, their own business, which uh, is still going to this day and has grown from the point at which they uh, developed it. So I have a keen interest uh, in seeing the entrepreneurs and the business people of the future being supported because uh, I've seen firsthand uh, how businesses that are developed from a, a very early idea can, can grow and can flourish. And I think it's worth noting that um, while undoubtedly and acknowledged by the Deputy First Minister, there is a, a road still to travel in some areas and there, are still, uh, there is still work that needs to be done, hence the establishment of the Scotland Can Do framework. But it is worth noting that uh, between 2008 to 2013, which are the last uh, period that figures are available for, the number of business, business births, as you will, in Scotland increased by 32 0.8%. That was uh, as a comparison to a 29.8% increase for the UK as a whole. So while I accept that Mr Fraser and I could trade statistics, I think there is a positive trend in terms of uh, business startups in Scotland. Indeed, the number of businesses in Scotland uh, in 2006 was 351 per 10,000 adults. Uh, it's now 377 per 10,000 adults. So there has been progress. Undoubtedly, uh, there is still work to be done, and I think what this debate will help crystallise is some of the ways in which that work can be carried forward. But um, one of the 
welcome measures I think that the Scottish Government has put in place has been the small business bonus scheme and speaking to small businesses in my constituency for many of them uh, those who started up following the small business bonus scheme they have seen it as a very important factor uh, in weathering them through those early years when often uh, when a business starts up it can be difficult to uh, get things going early on and there can be financial pressures at the early stages things like the small business bonus are absolutely important to businesses, especially when they're set against a, uh, a wider context where in Scotland, um, and uh, I appreciate that the same will exist in parts of England, uh, but in Scotland, and particularly in the northeast of Scotland, often the distance that needs to be travelled in order to get products to customers and to markets outside of the immediate local area uh, is that little bit further and therefore incurs an additional cost. There's also the recent uh, changes to VAT that took place, which pushed VAT up to 20%. And that, again, affects the margins for these companies and often can be the difference between somebody choosing to pursue an idea and somebody saying that the, that idea at this particular stage will not be taken forward. But I note that um, Mr Fraser suggested that what we needed to see more of were role models to whom young people in particular could aspire to. And being the helpful soul that I am, I have brought along two such role models with me. Not literally, but I have brought along two examples of entrepreneurs in the northeast of Scotland who I think are the very kind of role models that we should be pushing out there. And indeed, they are being pushed out there, certainly in the northeast of Scotland. One of those is Jamie Hutchin, who uh, his business is not in my constituency, but I've had the pleasure uh, of both meeting Jamie and sampling the products he produces. He uh, established a company called Coco Ooze, which is a chocolatier's uh, manufacturing high quality chocolate products. He established that in 2008 at the age of just 17. Uh, and now in 2015, employs a team of 25 people, has a coffee shop and chocolate workshop in the city centre of Aberdeen, providing uh, opportunities for people to go in and do their own chocolate making workshops uh, and parties uh, and recently won the Young Talent Award at the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Jamie uh, decided to, to do this while training to be a chef and uh, working alongside a master chocolatier uh, and decided from there that this was the route he wanted to pursue. Another uh, individual who is based in my constituency is Dr. Deborah O'Neill, who uh, established uh, the company Nova Biotics in 2004, which was a spin-out company uh, working in the biotech uh, area, uh, developing um, anti-infectives for difficult to treat uh, medically unmet diseases. And Nova Biotics have been a, a very uh, big success story in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, and Deborah herself was awarded Entrepreneur of the Year uh, at the 2014 Grampian Awards for Business Excellence. And I highlight these two examples for, for a couple of reasons. One, because they are two individuals who have shown entrepreneurial excellence and are the kind of people who we should be pushing out there as role models. Another, because they uh, came into the entrepreneurial field in very different directions. One, uh, through uh, working firsthand uh, uh, from a very young age and determining that he wished to establish his own business. Another, through the academic and university spin-out route, which, again, is something that we should be pushing and highlighting, particularly to those who are developing some of the excellent research in our universities as to how that research can then lead to business opportunities uh, in the future. I'm, I'm happy to take an intervention from Mr Mason. John Mason. Uh, with great interest to Mr Macdonald's um, constituents. Uh, and I just wondered, he said the role models. I just wonder if he knows if they've been going into schools at all, because... Uh, we have picked up, I, I feel a little bit, that maybe the school pupils are not being exposed uh, very much to people who have set up their own businesses. Mark I, I, I couldn't say f offhand whether either of the, the two individuals I've mentioned have been in the, the local schools, but I do know that um, one of the things that uh, I speak to often when I speak to head teachers uh, in my constituency is about the, the drive to establish enterprise networks in schools, enterprise clubs, and to really push 
uh, pupils to consider um, you know, operating small businesses within the school. Uh, and often uh, when I go to the uh, school fairs, as, as we all do in our constituencies, you can see pupils uh, at these fairs selling products that they themselves and the enterprise groups within the schools have produced. So I think that work is ongoing uh, in our schools. I, I note that uh, the, 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 the clock is ticking. So there's one final point, if I may, presiding officer. Uh, oh, you're shaking your head. And, uh, it, it may be ticking, but I can certainly give you the time back for the intervention. Oh, well, well uh, OK. Um, I can see other members instantly regretting that. But uh, one final point, if I may, presiding officer, and that is around um, the opportunity that can arise from adversity. Uh, in the northeast of Scotland just now, we do have uh, a situation where in the oil and gas sector there are individuals who are facing potential redundancies. Um, but at the same time, often from these situations, individuals who maybe uh, have never given thought to establishing their own business may choose to do so if the right support is there and if the opportunity to take that direction is there. And as well as the uh, excellent work that is being done by the Energy Jobs Task Force in trying to find new employment for individuals. I wonder if we should also be looking at what opportunities are there to maybe have uh, the advice and support given to those individuals who find themselves either in a situation of redundancy or at risk of redundancy in the oil and gas sector to maybe consider moving into uh, the establishing their own business, uh, given especially that oil and gas is identified as one of the eight innovation centres. So uh, I, I hope that that is an, uh, an idea which, if it isn't already being taken forward, might be considered. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call John Mason to be followed by Siobhan McMath. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I think, uh, to start with, as Mark Macdonald did, I would say there are some uh, very encouraging signs in this area. Uh, I noted in one of the briefings that the total early stage entrepreneurial activity rate, TEA, uh, among young people aged 18 to 29 has more than doubled from 3 per cent in 2008-9 to 8 per cent uh, by 2012-13. But I think it has been pointed out fairly by other speakers uh, that we have room for improvement. I think when we look back in Scotland, traditionally we have been good at starting our own businesses uh, and even growing them as well to become world-class organisations. Uh, but somewhere along the line, it does seem to me that it has become the norm uh, that we should be employees rather than self-employed. And there seems to have been a shift over time that that was the way to go. And as I did refer earlier, uh, certainly during my time at school, uh, that was the way uh, we were probably encouraged to go. And, and still I wonder how many young people have thought of actually starting their own business. Uh, I think I, I share Mark McDonald's experience of going into schools and, and products are being sold. Uh, but I think there's still a wee bit of a jump from that to people leaving school and starting their own business either immediately or later on. Um, I think sometimes the, the kind of work we do does often run in families, uh, and someone who is self-employed may well train up a son or a daughter uh, in preparation for taking over the family business. Clearly that is not inevitable, and I firmly believe that youngsters can and do choose uh, very different routes from their parents. Uh, however, if children grow up in a particular family environment, be that self-employment or in the caring professions or whatever, perhaps we should not be surprised if the tendency is for that uh, young person to go down a similar route. Uh, this week, I actually have a, a young person in my own office uh, in, in Parliament today uh, on work experience. And because I was preparing for this debate, I was asking him uh, about this and what kind of people were coming into the schools to talk to them about careers. And he said that his school was very good at getting a range of people in uh, to speak to the students about opportunities, but it did tend to be from larger businesses. Uh, and maybe there weren't from small businesses and people that had set up uh, their own businesses. And I think there is an issue there with time, because as Mark McDonald said, uh, one of his examples was somebody who was studying and running their own business. So clearly they do not have a lot of time uh, to begin into schools, but I think it is an issue. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's point that uh, schools may have changed marginally since I left. Um, however, I do uh, feel there's still a little bit of an issue there. Um, but as I say, my, the, the lad that's doing some work experience with me said he felt there was less emphasis on self-employment uh, and they were not particularly being encouraged to, to go in a particular direction where there definitely would be jobs. And I think generally this is an issue we've touched on before, uh, that schools um, 
don't just point young people to, to where might, they might like to go, but also where there will be jobs. Clearly, we don't want to try and fit round pegs into square holes, uh, but I think we have a responsibility to say to young people the areas where uh, jobs might be coming up. It has to be said that uh, some so-called self-employment is a bit artificial, and especially around the building industry, and in fact it's tax and other legislation that encourages what is called self-employment uh, for people, and that in, in many cases is men, uh, who, but who are to all intents and purposes employees. And from that point of view, I don't think we want to go down that route just to get the numbers of women up uh, to match the number of men who are self-employed. Now, over the years, uh, I note some of my colleagues have uh, given examples of businesses in their constituencies, so I don't want to be any different in that regard. Uh, and over the years, I've come across a number of people uh, who have set up their own businesses, not actually just in my constituency, but obviously beyond. Uh, for eight years or so, I worked for a nursing home group based in Lanarkshire, uh, which interestingly was run by an Egyptian surgeon. And I learned a lot from that, uh, not least that when you're part of a small management team, uh, the buck stops with you, and you have to just put in whatever hours it takes to work through uh, the problems uh, that that business might face at any particular time. And clearly that's an issue, going back to what uh, Linda Fabiani said, uh, about encouraging more women, that if women continue to be the main carers, that becomes uh, a very ch a big challenge for them. So there's, a, there's an, a number, I think, of connected issues that we need to deal with. Uh, secondly, I think, I seem to remember in a previous debate, I mentioned the guy that fixed my boiler, uh, or replaced my boiler, I should say, in my flat, and uh, he was somebody who had started training with one of the big energy companies and uh, had been employed by them. And I think when he worked there, if they were replacing a boiler, they had one person to do the gas, one person to do the water, one to do the electrical work, and someone else to repair the plaster work. But when he moved out and set up on his own, it meant he had to have all these skills himself. He had the challenge of finding new work to actually do. But on the plus side, he got the, the financial and the satisfaction rewards uh, of being in control of his own destiny. Uh, my third example, uh, a young guy who moved into our constituency, I think from uh, Stranraer or down that way, and he actually took over a small business uh, within the constituency. And I have to say, I was hugely impressed at his doing this. It was not an easy market to be in. It was highly competitive. And as I said, he was not even from the Glasgow area. But I found it interesting that he had the self-confidence to do that when many older folk I think even ones who might have known that sector better would not, frankly, have had the guts to do that. And I do think self-confidence is part of the issue in here, and, and that's a, a kind of national issue, and it's obviously a kind of deeper and a cultural issue as well, that uh, part of setting up your own business uh, is having the self-confidence to do it. And frankly, it's not necessarily something I myself would have felt I had when I was younger. And then one of the fastest growing small businesses in the East End of Glasgow has to be the West, a microbrewery, a pub and restaurant. And interestingly, this was set up uh, by a woman, uh, Petra Wetzel, who came to Glasgow from Germany to train as a solicitor and has moved on to turn around a, a struggling business uh, in around about 2006, 2008. And they have overcome the challenge of being in a slightly difficult uh, location to the east, uh, in, further east in the city, beyond the merchant city, where there's a lot of passing trade. So they do not get the same kind of passing trade. They've had to build up a reputation so that people deliberately go to West uh, in order to get their products. And I have to uh, commend them for uh, some of their products, including a uh, German-style beer made in Scotland, which I think is pretty well unique. Their beers are now widely, very widely available, and they're expanding in a variety of directions. One of their slogans is Glaswegian heart with a German head, uh, which I think challenges us to consider other combinations where a new business uh, could draw ideas from other parts of the world. Uh, but developed in a Scottish context. As we're encouraged to use more time, I thought I would throw in another local business, uh, which is Vanilla Blush, and uh, they are based in Bridgeton and have the interesting business that they uh, sell attractive underwear and swimwear, but it's for people who have had a colostomy uh, or other similar procedure. And uh, again, a very niche market, but selling worldwide uh, very much on the internet. And I have to say, I'm disappointed that my colleague along here, Gil Patterson, is not speaking uh, today because he's certainly one of us who has run his own business and I'm sure could have shared uh, a lot of experiences with us, uh, but has chosen not to do so unless he wants to intervene. Uh, now, I did find it interesting that of these examples I gave you, two uh, involved non-Scots, one Egyptian, one German. Uh, and I do wonder, actually, is it in some cultures, is it in some backgrounds that... Um, 
they, they are more used to setting up their own businesses and running their own businesses. Uh, Mr Stevenson. Stuart Stevens. Um, I wonder if uh, there is perhaps a bit more entrepreneurship around than we perhaps recognise, because it isn't all commercially applied. Um, if a church runs a coffee morning, they're being entrepreneurs, they're getting in money, providing itself, and the people involved are entrepreneurs. Perhaps the difficulty is moving people from that position of being able to do something that is capable of earning money into running a business and all the paperwork and administration that goes with that and perhaps not fully understanding and feeling confident they can do that. Perhaps we are entrepreneurs. Perhaps we just need that little bit of leg up into commercial exploitation. I, I think that's fair. And I'm interested that uh, Mr Stevenson uses that word confident again in his question, uh, which I touched on earlier on. I think that is definitely uh, part of the issue in all this. Um, I do feel sometimes that the UK system too encourages people uh, not to grow their own businesses but to uh, sell out. Okay? Um, and it does seem that some countries are better at uh, keeping that. We already mentioned when I intervened in Mr Pearson, maybe we should look at other kinds of ownership uh, like employer ownership and co-op. But, presiding officer, in conclusion, I'm very supportive of this re-emphasis on entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, I hope we can see more businesses started in Scotland and also that they can grow and develop without necessarily losing their own local roots and ownership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I now call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Government for bringing forward this debate to allow us to discuss the Scotland Can Do, a framework for entrepreneurship and innovation. As a society, of course, we should be grateful for the contribution of our entrepreneurs. I'm happy to have the opportunity to put on record my own admiration for the spirit they have shown to get where they are and to state my hope that we in this chamber will do all we can to support them. I was reminded while I was preparing for my speech today of the so-called You Didn't Build That speech given by President Obama on the US campaign tour in 2012. I'm sure many of you will recall that the President was chastised by the rival Republican campaign as playing down entrepreneurs and their contribution to American society. In fact, the point he was making was a sensible one that we would do well to remember today. Nobody, no matter how successful they are, got there alone. Those who have achieved success should be congratulated for it, but it should never be forgotten that our public services built the schools that taught them, the hospitals that cared for them, and all of the other services they have relied upon. By all means, recognise the efforts and drive of the go-getters, but the contribution of the public and private sector workers who helped them get where they are today are just as worthy of our adulation. In the ministerial foreword of Scotland Can Do, building on a vision to become a world-leading entrepreneurial and innovative nation, the Cabinet Secretary seemed to recognise this point, writing in emboldened letters that enterprise and growth must be accessible to all for the benefit of all. The aspiration to maximise the potential of entrepreneurs for the betterment of our entire society is undoubtedly shared across this chamber and Scotland. As said before, and I really mean it, our Parliament works best when we come together across party lines and work towards improving the law of our constituents. And I recognise some of the efforts made by government in this area. I accept that in many ways the Scottish Government is hindered in efforts to make this statement a reali reality by a regressive Tory Government who do not share the values. However, the Scottish Government must be held accountable for the areas over which it exerts full control. As the opposition, it is our obligation to bring these matters before the Government, because at the moment, the enterprise and growth the Government members have spoken about just isn't serving everyone in our communities. As the Scottish Labour Party spokesperson for women's employment, I'd like to go into a bit more detail about the challenges facing women. I'm happy to say that this government and its predecessor deserve real credit for the increase in the number of women who are self-employed compared to 2004. However, there is yet work to be done on that front. As of 2013, only 7.8% of women, in comparison to 15% of men, were self-employed. Employed. While statistics from the Close the Gap Partnership Project indicate that only one third of chief executive officers in Scotland are women. And as Linda Fabiani reiterated earlier, Professor of Entrepreneurship at Strathclyde University, Sarah Carter, demonstrated the entrepreneurial disparity in these numbers, stating, if rates of women-led businesses equal those of men, the contribution to Scotland's gross value added would increase by £7.6 billion to £13 billion. This equates to a 5.3% growth in the size of the Scottish economy. And I welcome the initiatives that the Cabinet Secretary spoke about in his opening speech, particularly the network of women ambassadors, and I hope that this goes some way to challenging the figures that we have in front of us today. 
We all know that science, technology, engineering and math sector is one of the fastest growing areas of our economy and it is in this area that we need as many qualified people as possible in. Yet the scale of occupational segregation in this sector remains truly astonishing. Out of 24,000 engineering apprentices, only 6 to 8 were female last year. Stats from Skills Development Scotland do not suggest that we can expect this to get much better in the years to come, with 85% of those doing IT courses at school male. At high school level, it is clear that we are just not doing enough to promote the STEM subjects to young women. Too few, or even those few women who do graduate with a degree in a STEM subject, do not pursue their subject for a career. With the Government's 2015 Maximising Economic Opportunities for Women in Scotland report demonstrating that 73% of female STEM graduates do not work in the field after graduation. It used to be that advances in science and technology, technology liberated women. Now they have the potential to hold them back. All signs suggest that the jobs of the future will come from the industries women are less likely to work in. If we are not careful, we will lock women out of these career paths and trap them in traditional roles, which are all too often low paid and low skilled. Even the government's own flagship modern apprenticeship programme seems to only reinforce gender segregation. As many here will already know, in 2012-13, 98% of construction apprentices were male and 97% of children's care apprentices were female. In a debate which seems to, be, to me to be fundamentally about how we empower our constituents to unlock their true potential, it would be remiss of me not to mention the damaging impacts the cuts to college places have had on women's prospects of studying STEM subjects. Since 2007-08, there has been a drop of 41 per cent in the number of women at college. With damaging cuts like this, how can we expect women to fulfil their promise? As I bring my speech to a close, I would like to remind everyone here of some of the pertinent facts. On average, women working full-time in Scotland earn £95.60 pence a week less than their male counterparts, and it is still common for women to take a cut in their pay grade and job status to find suitable, flexible work. Until we right these wrongs, we will never unlock the entrepreneurial spirit and innovation of 50 per cent of our population. Scotland can do, but must do more. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Claire Adamson to be followed by Chick Brodie. Uh, seven minutes or nearby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to rise in support of the Scotland Can Do framework, which makes clear Scotland's ambition and sets out the priority areas where the Scottish Government continues to support and to act to see Scotland become a world-leading, entrepreneurial and innovative nation. Like many of my colleagues in the Chamber today, I had a life and career prior to politics in the information technology sector. I was an Oracle um, project manager uh, with a number of consultancy firms and laterally as a European development manager for a global document management company um, launched in Glasgow. So I hope you will indulge me a little in my personal interest if I concentrate on the fantastic digital technology economy in Scotland today. That is, of course, if Mr Stevenson hasn't scared them off to the Swiss Alps. I take a keen interest in the industry body, Scotland IS, and would like to um, reference a recent press release from them, How Scotland Learned to Create the Billion Dollar Tech Unicorns. It states the Scott tech, se tech sector is thriving, even with, even with a venture capital problem. It may have escaped the attention of Old Street, but the technologists of Silicon Glen have been busy of late. For the last few months, Fan Jewel, fantasy sports specialists that hail from Edinburgh, have looked likely contenders to become the second one billion pound company, one billion dollar company, sorry, to emerge from Scottish cap the Scottish capital following the success of flight comparison site Sky Skyscanner, which attained unicorn status only this February and also began in Edinburgh. Skyscanner CEO Gareth Williams had a vision of a single website that could collect, collate, compare prices for every commercial flight in the world. And from a simple Excel spreadsheet, Skyscanner was born. This company has grown to become the number one flight search engine in Europe. And in 2011, a Singapore office was opened to help grow Skyscanner in the Asia Pacific market. It now operates worldwide, UK, Singapore, Beijing, Shenzhen, Miami, Miami sorry, uh, Barcelona, Sofia and Budapest. It simply is one of the great success stories of entrepreneurship in Scotland. Scotland Guy S go on in their article to talk about the support that is given to the tech industry in Scotland. Code based, Code based in Edinburgh is housed in an unassuming civil service building in the south side of the city. 
Sprawled across three floors, the incubator houses some of the keenest technology firms in the whole of Scotland. It is a spin-off from a previous start-up incubator, no, incubator known as TechCube, and the project's founding companies literally put up walls and just got down to business. Codebase is perhaps one of the most prominent examples of the Scottish tech sector coming together to support its members, tenants, and the, the incubators enjoy a host of formal and informal benefits from monthly leases to regular meetings in which they can swap tips in the industry. It may interest um, Mr Stevenson to know that despite some of the threats to the software industry that may come as a result of the Queen's speech, one of the things highlighted by the, the uh, codebase um, users is the quality of life in Scotland. And it's great that the industry has been at the forefront of ad advocating better working conditions such as ass assets, and the assets are hardly trivial, um, given that they're based in the rolling hills of Scotland, uh, and it's a much more um, likely home for unicorns than the cramped, smoggy city of London. If I can stick with those unicorns, uh, presiding officer, this time of the fantasy variety, the world of fantasy games entertainment is about as far away from my own IT experience as it's possible to be. But as a co-chair of the cross-party group on computer games industry, it would be remiss of me not to mention the great work that has been done to support entrepreneurs in this area. Later this, this month, Expo North will take place in Inverness. Um, in the last couple of years, Expo has been increasing the presence of games and computing games companies, and last year saw a dozen companies taking bar part in a games playground, showing off their titles to an audience of hundreds of creative industry types from music, film, television, and other areas of the creative industries. In a recent report, the TIGA Association of Independent Games Developers Associations, TIGA, the trade association, um, published a report called Scotland's Video Games in Industry is Blooming and contributes 99 million to the UK GDP. The research was carried out between 2012 and 2013 and some of the areas that take a highlight is the number of game developing studios grew from 81 to 94, an increase of 16%. The number of creative staff in studios grew from 766 to 964, an increase of 26%. The number of jobs has increased by 18%, and combined direct and indirect direct tax revenues generated by the sector for the Treasury, Treasury increased from 35 million to 41 million, an increase of 17%. This means that Scotland now represents 11.4% of the UK total games companies, up from 8.8% in 2012. The Scottish games industry has a headcount of 2,726 employees, 10% of the entire UK video games industry headcount. And it truly is one of our success stories. If I could quote Paul Durant, who's the Director of Business Development at Aberty University, uh, an institution which has become synonymous with the games industry, he says, I've been involved in establishing and operating incubation type support facilities for fledging games companies since 1999. We must grow the volume of new IP creation in a greater number of early stage companies to maximise our chances of picking and nurturing the potential winners so that they secure success in the international market. Well-disciplined and properly resourced business incubation will help to sustain these startups and build them into a UK companies of scale. And I couldn't agree more. And of course, Mr. Duran, also, Aberty University also serves as the governing body a member of the, the National Virtual Incubator. This offers support to the tech startups, young entrepreneurs, and students incubating breakthrough business ideas. And it involves research facilities, linking up science parks and academia, all in the support of the industry. I was delighted this year when the e Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee conducted their inquiry into the economic impact of film, TV, video games industries. And what they say of the, um, the games industry is that the committee believes that the video games industry in Scotland is full of talent, enthusiasm and ingenuity. It's a fast-paced industry, quite like, unlike any other, which provides high-quality job opportunities. We heard that for the industry to thrive, it needed to be able to attract and retain talented people by creating sustainable and successful businesses. I believe that Scotland can.
can do this. Many thanks. <clears throat> I now call on Chuck Brody to be followed by Dr. Elaine Murray. Uh, seven minutes or thereby, please, Mr. Thank Brody. You. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, I, of course, support the motion tonight. I do so because I'm passionate about my nation, but also its performance. I've been somewhat lucky in my past to have uh, run international businesses, uh, to have helped small companies start up, uh, to turn around companies that have been in trouble, and I've never been disappointed by the challenge that's been faced by those that I've been involved with at home, and the acceptance of Scotland's position to support, manage, and skill international uh, businesses. So I do support the motion, of course, and I am passionate about this subject. There are many ways to define the success of a nation, whether it be financial, securities of environment, of energy supply, of health, of education, or more certainly an amalgam uh, of all of these. There can be only one certainty to distribute wealth and prosperity fairly, and that is to create it. Enterprise, growth, prosperity should be there for the benefit of all. That will only become, I believe, with a focused economic strategy, with a defined sectoral approach where we have, or can have, a competitive advantage. With improved productivity and outcomes, with innovation, yes, you know, certainly from the R&D departments of our universities uh, and, and the consequent technology transfers that flow from that, but also in the inquiring and solution-driven minds uh, across our nation. All done, uh, I believe, increasingly with the partnership of government and business and communities. And also with, I believe, an increasing partnership of capital and labour. We do, uh, presiding officer, have some internationally competitive entrepreneurs, and I applaud the work that uh, Scottish Development International uh, do in, in supporting these. And we do have creative, educated and skilled people. Our challenge, I think, is we need uh, more of them, and that's where I believe the uh, framework provides a foundation stone to do, to, uh, upon which to build. These people are a significant asset. These growing businesses are a significant asset but so are our natural assets uh, and resources, and we should not diminish these. I was happy uh, only two weeks ago to put together investors and developers to look at our natural mineral resources with a happy conclusion that we have gold in Ayrshire, uh, and hopefully we will see development of that soon, but not just that, nickel, cobalt, silver, all of, and rare earths which we need to support uh, potential export industries. The first challenge of any economic strategy is to establish, I believe, a vision, a vision of the kind of nation we want to be, not just economically and internationally, but socially at home. And Mr. Fraser raised some issues, as we've discussed at the Economy Committee, but even he cannot deny that there has been, in a lot of cases, an acceptance of the challenge uh, that uh, uh, faces us and to develop the opportunities that we believe lie in our way. Consider now, and that vision, to consider what we should do now is to consider now and ongoing our strengths, acknowledge our weaknesses, seek, certainly seek opportunities and face and dispense with the threats that we also face, a meaningful SWOT analysis that provides us with a recurring basis to fully develop all of the economic strategies to support the vision that we have. Firstly, a competitive at home and abroad. Secondly, a reducing inequalities at home. That will, as a consequence, and I've seen it elsewhere, generate increased productivity, as indeed will, thirdly, greater participation and stakeholding of employees in the workplace and in company outcomes, both in the public and the private sectors. Fourthly, innovative, not just as mentioned through the vehicles of the university R&D departments, but of ideas, the ideas evolution and indeed the ideas revolution that flow from the likes of East Parks, which has been mentioned, 
social enterprises, certainly, and the third sector also. I'll give you one example. You know, a, a, I, I was told of a, a, a guy who walked in off the street into one of our new business startup hubs and said that he believed he could dry washing on rotaries in the rain. And of course, everyone laughed. That's impossible. Until he produced this design of an umbrella and a canopy which was fitted to a rotary dryer, and indeed, guess what? Yes, you can dry washing in the rain. So competitive, yes. Innovative, yes. Productive, certainly. And using techniques, techniques that have been used for some years past in terms of Lean, Kaizen, Six Sigma, and all of the up-to-date uh, improved productivity methods. To, of course. Mr. Stevenson. Remember, like myself, having been in technology, you'll maybe remember uh, Andy Grove, chief executive of Intel's uh, autobiography, Only the Paranoid Survive, uh, where he talks about suddenly coming in on several occasions on a Monday morning, find his business had all but vanished. Isn't flexibility and an ability uh, to respond to rapidly changing circumstances an equally important part of what makes a real entrepreneur who will be successful for the long term? Rudy. It also requires the involvement uh, of all of the workforce to uh, accept that uh, uh, capability. Uh, one of the other things we have talked about is skill investment. We have to in expand our skill base. To burst, for example, the gender bubble that says it's okay, for example, for some women uh, to work on oil rigs in the North Sea, but to do the catering, not the uh, engineering. And certainly, as has been called for, we need much more women entrepreneurs. In defining a, a presiding officer the focused markets and product and service sectors we wish to win, the big opportunity, indeed requirement, supported by our enterprise energy agencies will only be capital, capitalised upon if we develop sales and marketing skills per the action framework. To develop sales and marketing, to develop language, to understand international customs. And on that basis, the world is our oyster. Presiding officer, uh, one could, with a passion, speak about this uh, for days, never mind uh, seven or eight minutes. We have a great opportunity. I believe the action framework provides the basis for that. Of course, it, as I said, it's a, it's, a recurring, it's a recurring need for review, but certainly with private and public capital investment on new technologies and infrastructure, we can improve continued focused investment in the skills of our people, so having the right service of product and products, improving productivity, increased participation of trade unions, businesses, the third sector and communities, all will help. As will, in the current envi environment, I say this meaningfully and strongly, enhanced population growth and, and acquirement, and a realistic proportionate equality, consequently, of income. Scotland can do, and Scotland will do. Excellent. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Elaine Murray to be followed by Dennis Roberts. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I too am pleased to take the opportunity of taking part in this debate. The Scottish Government's economic strategy states that the Government believes in a One Scotland approach and that tackling inequality and increasing growth are mutually supportive, and indeed it would be difficult not to agree with that perspective. The stated actions to improve to promote inclusive growth rightly include realising opportunities across Scotland cities, towns and rural areas and the need to deliver more equal growth across the country. And so I hope that the Scottish Government will endeavour to ensure that the whole country benefits from economic development and its performance indicators will include specific reference to rural areas, such as Dumfries and Galloway, in fact, such as much of the south of Scotland, which has suffered from economic disadvantage for many years, which has been difficult to resolve. And I'm not suggesting that is somehow the fault of this government has actually been a long-standing issue in the area. The local economy is very dependent on micro and small businesses, nothing wrong with that, but few of those, them grow uh, to become medium-sized enterprises. Wages are the lowest in Scotland, GDP is, uh, per head is low, rural employment still tends to be in traditional rural in industries and can be seasonal, low-paid and insecure. There are challenges with accessibility and connectivity, which vary across the region. Uh, there is also, of course, a shortage of affordable housing and relatively high levels of fuel poverty. Many micro-businesses 
are not able to benefit from the apprenticeship programmes. As I have mentioned in previous debates, this could be addressed by enabling small businesses to share an apprentice with another local business of a similar nature, and I hope that can be taken forward. I welcome the significant investment in broadband in the region, investment from the Scottish and the UK governments and by Dumfries and Galloway Council. This investment is starting to make a real difference in parts of the region. However, we still have problems with mobile phone coverage. Actually, in some fairly well-populated towns and villages, such as Loch Maben in my constituency, it is still difficult to get any mobile signal at all, never mind 4G coverage. Uh, in preparing for this debate, I was interested to read in the briefing from University of Scotland about the success of our universities and the work they are doing on knowledge exchange and the creation of new businesses. This is indeed a change in culture since the days I was involved in academic research. And I see uh, uh, Roddy Campbell isn't here, but I was actually involved at one time in using lasers to look at free ra the structure of free radicals. But in those days, pure or basic research was sometimes considered to be somehow morally superior to applied research. And of course, high quality pure research is still very valuable and Scottish universities do remain extremely successful in those fields and long may they do so. But the ability of research to drive enterprise has over the years been better appreciated. That change of culture is part due to national action over the years, things like the creation of the Scottish Institute of Enterprise in 2002, promoting entrepreneurship among students, uh, the increasing provision of incubation uh, space and, and support by several of our universities, and, uh, for example, collaborative, collaborative ventures between universities to support postgraduate students who wish to start, start up their own businesses. The Universities Scotland briefing cites examples of how universities can be the drivers of, of city uh, development. But going back to the issues facing areas like Dumfries and Galloway, I hope to see that our universities can be the drivers of town and rural development too. For example, there are clear synergies which the universities already established in, in Dumfries and Galloway are promoting, uh, such as aspects to do with the uh, demographics of the region. Now, sometimes people talk about the older age profile in Dumfries and Galloway uh, of the population as if it's a problem. But it's also an opportunity to develop the most innovative services and methods of support for older people, involving, of course, older people and their designs. And as the demographic of so, so much of the first, so much of the first world ages, these developments provide opportunities in our region to become a centre of excellence uh, for services uh, to older people. And I know that there are uh, real ambitions locally to try and drive that forward. Similarly, the development of renewable energies, coupled with the expertise of researchers in the Crime and Carbon Centre, provide opportunities for the region in developing new techniques and new business opportunities, not only in energy generation, but also, importantly, in energy conservation. There has been already some excellent research performed on tourism at the Glasgow University campus in uh, Dumfries, and also Dumfries and Galloway College has very recently opened new facilities at their main campus at the Crichton, which will support the new hospitality course, which is about to be offered there. I know that uh, uh, the education secretary ha had intended to come to open that, and unfortunately wasn't able to do, do so at the, the, the last minute, but I hope members of the government will be able to see what is actually on offer uh, at Dumfries and Galloway College. Tourism is important to the region, and the focus of many of its micro and small businesses. I still think we possibly could do better in helping businesses to work together to attract visitors to the area. Um, we are in Dumfries and Galloway just next door to the lakes and I visit on occasions last bank holiday being one and I am always frustrated and envious when I see the numbers of visitors attracted into the lakes. Stuart Stevenson. Okay, Stuart. Thank you very much. I, I wonder if the uh, member shares my excitement at one innovation that uh, the area uh, she talks about has certainly brought us to, and that is the book town. And the idea that towns can develop specialisms, even though they're remote and comparatively small. I wonder if there are lessons for entrepreneurship that arise out of the book town experience in Dumfries and Galloway. Dr. Lane Money. Member is correct there, and also under a number of other uh, uh, ventures like the Seven Stains project, which is uh, the uh, uh, mountain biking uh, tra trail right throughout the south of Scotland, which brings visitors into the area. But as I say, you know, when we go to areas like the Lake District, you can see the difference between their congested roads, whatever time of year it is, there are always visitors pouring into their towns. And I just wonder what we can do just to bring some fraction of those visitors, some of those visitors just a wee bit further north up the M6 and the M74 and into Dumfries and Galloway to enjoy uh, our quieter area but equally beautiful uh, scenery of the area. So infrastructure improvements are 
key, I think, to ensuring that Dumfries and Galloway can do as we want Scotland to be able to do. And at times of economic restriction, every opportunity to attract external investment, additional investment, must be taken. Uh, the south of Scotland has lost out on European funding, which could have been used to improve infrastructure and accessibility, as the region itself is not a nuts two area, despite many of us campaigning for this the last time round, which is probably around about a decade ago. Under the current designation, the low GDP of rural South Scotland is hidden as it is included in the same designations as Glasgow and Edinburgh. And it would be helpful to the South, and it would be of absolutely no disadvantage to anywhere else in Scotland if the South of Scotland was designated as a nuts two area on its own. Mr. Stevenson, briefly, I'm, please. I'm sorry, this is going to be fairly eccentric. I just wonder if the fact that the road appears to be different because it, the M6 becomes the 74, even though it's the same road, might actually be psychologically a little barrier for people in the late district. I've just thought of this off the cuff, so... <laughs> I have to say, I've never actually uh, thought about that, whether the road was actually an issue in there. Now, can I say, I don't make any of these arguments to complain or moan about our hard lot. I think there are real opportunities for my constituency and the region in which it is situated, but I don't think they will be realised unless specific actions tailored to the needs of a rural area uh, are now understood and taken. And I'd also like to reiterate some of the points made by Graham Pearson that actually progress does need to be measurement and measured, and I think the, the government should be challenging itself, itself by setting timescales by which its actions should be achieved, and so that we can actually actually see how successful uh, we have been achieving these. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Dennis Robertson up to seven minutes or thereby. Please, Mr Robertson, after which we we'll move to closing speeches. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, our big asset is our people, and there's absolutely no doubt about that. But our people uh, are as diverse as the opportunities that are there for them. If I look at my own constituency, uh, in Aberdeenshire West, I mean, the oil and gas industry is probably the largest industry in that area. But it wouldn't survive without the diversity and support of the other infrastructures um, in that chain. And that could be right down to the, the, the people that actually just open the sort of sandwich business to support the workforce. Or it could be the, the person that decided that there was a lot of glass in the office buildings and become a window cleaner. The reason I say these things, presiding officer, is because we need to look at our communities and where we live and look at the opportunities that are there for our young people. And when we're looking through the curriculum for excellence, and there is, I suppose, some emphasis for our teachers to help guide our young people for the opportunities in and around their own environments, that influence is sometimes stifled, smothered, um, and perhaps even kicked out the park by, our, by their parents because the parents sometimes think, no, don't. No, don't have that ambition. But of course, it can be the opposite. And I think where I'm coming from, presiding officer, is, is this. The young people quite often need to make up their own mind and think about the opportunities that they want to do and the opportunities that they would like to take. I recently, um, with the uh, apprentice, Apprenticeship Week, visited a Milton Brasserie in my uh, own constituency at Crathis near Bankery. And there was a young lad there, a chef. Now, his ambition is to go to China and to learn the trade in China and come back and open his own restaurant. Now, that's absolutely fantastic. And that is because he has, he, he's doing something that he wanted to do. It's not an oil and gas. It's not something that, that, you know, that, that was there within uh, his family or anything. It was something that he felt he wanted to do. And the opportunity came along through the apprenticeship. And it's this diversity that I think that we need to nurture within our, our communities. And some of our communities can actually grow without having this uh, aspect of internationalisation of exports, which is something that would be extremely welcome, of course. But sometimes we just need to look at within our communities. And when I looked at the, uh, the Fresh Start programme that the government extended for our hotels, restaurants uh, and pubs, you know, I started to think of some of the, the community areas, uh, some of the hotels and pubs and restaurants that may, maybe did close because it was too, it was too expensive. And maybe one of the things we need to look at is how we support them. And certainly through the Small Business Bonus Scheme is something that is there that <coughs> does help and enable these small businesses to grow. 
But one of the aspects, and I think my colleague Mark McDonald mentioned uh, VAT, that sometimes, and it's something we can't obviously tackle in this parliament, but if we're going to encourage these small industries sometimes to have this sense of growth and this sense of purpose and this opportunity to develop, then we need to look at what is there and what the obstacles are that are, 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 are keeping them back. So what I would say, presiding officer, is the opportunities can be there, but we need to have the ability to nurture our young talent in the di direction that they want to go. Now, we've got the lowest unemployment in the country within a, our consti my constituency. But in saying that, you know, we have had a troubled times recently within the oil and gas industry. But that's also been an opportunity for many, for many to look at what is going on within their own communities. And some of these, you know, engineers, for instance, are looking at the opportunities that maybe within the public sector or starting their own business. And this has been the same for um, the people coming maybe out of the Air Force, using their skills maybe to go into the oil and gas industry or indeed renewables. Presiding officer, the government bodies that are there, I believe, are, are doing their best to try and encourage our young people in the direction that they would wish to go. So SDS, for instance, do, I believe, provide the opportunities and the mentoring for some people. But what we heard in the EET committee when we're doing creative industries is someone might have the idea, that idea in a software program in the games industry, for instance, that because of their course, they had no skills in terms of maybe setting up a business. They had no idea about maybe getting uh, the, the finance they needed to set up the business. So we need to look at what we're doing in terms of our universities and, and colleges who are looking at our young people and providing them the opportunity if they're going into a business world or hoping to go into that business world. Now, within my own constituency, um, recently, the Falls of Hugh a restaurant uh, a, a was the, the best restaurant within the North East. And again, I, I mention this because it encouraged the tourism within that area. And this is something that I think you know, we need to also so, uh, to, to nurture within Scotland because we are a country that people love to come to. But they love to come not just for our scenery and our weather, um, but they, they like to come and explore our, our, our culture as well. And if, and if we're going to try and, and ensure that we have this uh, ability to uh, protect our tourism as well, we've got to try and ensure that there's a gateway open to our young people to, to uh, embrace that. Because it's not all about that uh, big business idea. It's not all about going into oil and gas. We need to look around us to see what opportunities are there. And it may well be that initially you start off in one direction and perhaps go in another later. But we have a, a fantastic diverse country and a wonderful, diverse uh, uh, young people. And I think we will. We will, because we can do. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. Many, many thanks. We now move to the closing speeches. I just remind all members who took part in the debate that they should return to the Chamber now or as soon as possible to, to be for, in for the closing speeches. Murder Fraser, up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, this has been a, a wide-ranging debate. We had... Uh, Roderick Campbell referencing Star Trek, uh, Stuart Stevenson on the Snoopers Charters, John Mason promoting swimwear, and Chick Brodie heralding an Ayrshire gold rush. Fans of the Toy Story film franchise can look forward to a new character, Chick the Prospector, doll in the toy shops in time for Christmas. Now, the question I raised at the very start, uh, and which is addressed in uh, my amendment, is the fundamental question, why are we lagging behind other parts of the United States? Uh, Kingdom. And a number of members referred to this point in their contributions. Uh, Margaret McDougall mentioned this and referred to the good work done by Entrepreneurial uh, Spark and in particular their programme of opening hatcheries across the UK with support from uh, RBS and she referenced the one in Ayrshire but they're happening elsewhere in Scotland and elsewhere in the United Kingdom and are of great value. Anne McTaggart in her contribution referred to our historic legacy in Scotland of innovation, which makes it perhaps all the more extraordinary we've come to this past today in the country, where despite 
this great long list of uh, Scottish uh, inventors and scientists who we can all name, uh, we are not doing so well in terms of entrepreneurship compared to other parts of the UK. There was an attempt by some members to try and identify some of the reasons for this. Mark MacDonald uh, raised the question of businesses in the North East and their distance from markets. Elaine Murray talked about specific problems in rural areas, such as in the south of Scotland and the challenges they face around uh, connectivity, broadband, mobile phone coverage that are familiar to all of us who represent rural areas. Perhaps the most thoughtful attempt to try and address this came from John Mason, who talked about a cultural issue uh, that faces us, where you know, perhaps we've grown up in a culture where the norm is being the employee, not the employer, not an entrepreneur. Is it the case that children in schools grow up in an environment where it's seen as being the norm to leave school and get a job rather than go and start a business? And is there an issue there in schools that we have to try and address? And the importance of a family environment where people have grown up uh, working for others and not necessarily attuned to this concept of going out and working for oneself. And Dennis Robertson uh, mentioned this in his contribution a moment ago, where the role of parents perhaps is not always supportive of those who want to be entrepreneurs, where parents try and push children down a particular route to get a, get a job, perhaps a, a career in the, in the professions, um, rather than actually going out and set, their own business, set up their own business. And all this takes me back to the, the point I made at the very start, which is, I think, we need to properly understand what's behind this. Why are we not doing so well? Maybe that's an area where we do need some research uh, from uh, the Scottish Government or one of its agencies to try and understand why we're not making the progress we should be. Because if all the best strategies in the world uh, won't deliver the success we need if they're not underpinned by a proper understanding of the fundamental issues. But one thing that came strongly through the debate from a number of speakers was this whole question of needing to change the culture and starting with the young people. There was a lot of reference made to the uh, Prince's Trust. The uh, Deputy First Minister mentioned their announcement of funding resource for a new centre in the west of Scotland, which uh, is welcome. Uh, clearly, they have an excellent track record under their, their previous guise of the PSYBT. They were well known for giving advice to young people, helping with sourcing of funding, providing a mentoring. Uh, and that had an enormous impact on the whole generation of young entrepreneurs. And Rod Campbell mentioned the young uh, innovators challenge which is part of the can do strategy also very important in encouraging young people uh, in entrepreneurship there's a role for the colleges the deputy first minister mentioned again the bridge to business program uh, in further education colleges delivered by young enterprise scotland the carnegie trust in their research found that three out of four of further education students agree that more opportunities to meet local successful business people would be beneficial and more than 80% who participated in an enterprise activity with a local entrepreneur at, at college found that useful. But only one in three of further education uh, college students had been invited to such an encounter, which suggests there's a lot of work still to do. And the Carnegie Trust are calling on the Scottish Government to support schools, colleges and universities to, deliver, to develop rather stronger relationships with the local business community. And they're keen to promote the use of alumni networks to bring local entrepreneurs and young people together to inspire and inform about the realities of business startup. Yes, of course, Mr. Robertson. Yes. Mr. Robertson. Uh, I, I thank Murdo Fraser. Um, would you agree it's actually a partnership? It's not just the role of government, it's the role of business and government and all sectors working together to, to ensure that uh, this happens. Yes, indeed. I'm very happy to agree with that comment by, by Mr. Robertson. It's, it's, it is a, a, an area where we need all uh, partners uh, coming together and helping out. I want to touch briefly on the role of uh, universities. Rod Campbell reminded us of the good work being done on research at St Andrews. We know that Scottish universities punch above their weight in terms of research. They, they perform better than the UK as a whole, and research is, is fundamental. But we also need knowledge exchange. Here, Scottish universities are working with 20,000 Scottish businesses and 10,000 businesses outside Scotland. And that includes, in that total, 13,000 Scottish SMEs. And we have more spin-outs from university in Scotland than any other region in the UK, including London. Eight innovation centres have been established in areas such as construction, uh, biotechnology, uh, aquaculture, uh, oil and gas, uh, and others. And when it comes to students, 
The Scottish Institute for Enterprise, set up in 2002, established with support from Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish Funding Council, uh, has increased the number of students who consider entrepreneurship a real option during and after uh, their studies. Every Scottish university is taking part in this initiative. It runs competitions and events for students to try and make sure they understand entrepreneurship and are equipped with the necessary uh, skills. Some universities have entrepreneurs in residence. Uh, some provide incubator spaces for new businesses such as Edinburgh, Napier uh, and Abertay in Dundee. And the role of uh, role models is absolutely essential. Mark uh, Macdonald mentioned some businesses in his constituency. Uh, he mentioned that the chocolatiers, I was simply observed that given his newly slimmed down version, he's not been sampling enough of their products, I would suggest. John Mason said that we need to have these role models in schools, and I think that's right, but we need to accept that entrepreneurs are themselves busy people. Their priority is their business is about making money and providing employment, and therefore we have to be sensitive to demands on their time when we ask them to help out in improving uh, the culture for others. And there are many success stories, areas where we are leading the world. We heard in this debate about the creative industries where uh, the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee recently produced a detailed report. Claire Adamson talked about Skystanner and FanDuel, two world-leading innovative uh, businesses with an international market based right here in Edinburgh, providing employment and with the skills here. So we can lead the world in certain areas, but we need to do more of it. Just to close, presiding officer, we, if we can emulate the best, then we can build entrepreneurship in Scotland. We are doing some of the right things. The can-do strategy is a step forward in the right direction. But as the figures show, there is still a long way to go. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Jackie Bailey. Up to 10 minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This has been an interesting debate with much agreement about what we should be doing to support entrepreneurship and innovation in the Scottish economy. I confess, though, I didn't expect to hear discussion about Napoleon, Star Trek, unicorns, colostomy bags and umbrellas for whirly gigs. I think that's testament to the innovation and creativity of the members of this parliament. But can I say in all seriousness, John Swinney is absolutely right. We should be ambitious for our country and our economy. And at the heart of the debate for me is the importance of education, the encouragement of our young people to know that they can do anything, achieve anything and not to limit their thinking. And to understand that working for yourself, being bold and innovative and creating wealth are indeed all positive things to do. Now, I well remember the Young Enterprise Group at Dumbarton Academy. I think they managed to separate me from £40 for a game. Fantastic game it was too. But what was more valuable were the lessons that they learnt in that process. The creativity needed to generate ideas. The ability to transform a good idea into something that people wanted to buy. The marketing of a product and yes, ultimately the persuasion of people to part with their hard-earned cash. And knowing some of these young people as I do, they've taken those lessons, they've applied them in college, in university and in life, and I am hopeful for their future and also for ours. But I want to reflect, as others have done, um, on the past and setting our sights high, and let me echo Roderick Campbell and Anne McTaggart, because a quick look at our history gives you a taste of the breadth and importance of our enterprise and innovation. We are proud of achievements from innovators like Alexander Graham Bell creating the telephone, Helensburg citizen John Logie Baird creating the television, James Watt's steam engine to current day Palamas wave energy converters, Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin to modern genetics with Dolly the sheep at the Roslyn Institute at Edinburgh University. And who knew that Scotland invented stamps? postmarks and postcards too. So we do have a proud history, but it is to the future that we should turn. And if you ask the business community what they would want to see now to encourage enterprise and innovation, many of them simply say they want a supply chain of well-educated, ambitious and confident young people emerging from our education system, both as skilled people that they can hire, but as entrepreneurs of the future that can create the business and opportunities that we all seek. But more than anything, they would say it's about confidence and drive, and as the government would observe, a can-do attitude.
In that context, I don't want to strain the consensus, but let me gently point out the challenges faced in Scottish education are not conducive to creating that confident and skilled workforce. The fact that our levels of reading, writing and maths are declining rather than improving must be a concern to us all. And I am pleased that that's recognised by the First Minister because we know that that level of inequality hampers our economy, it hampers enterprise and innovation, it hampers the progress of our young people too. OECD research suggested that inequality has cost Scotland an estimated 8.5% of GDP over the past 25 years. So we want to see economic growth, we want a strong and prosperous economy, we want enterprise and innovation. So education can't just be a social policy, it must be part of the government's long-term economic strategy. Now I recognise and applaud much of the work that universities have undertaken to encourage innovation and to work in partnership with entrepreneurs and with business, taking theoretical ideas and concepts to the market and doing so in collaboration is absolutely key. Now, we know universities in Scotland punch above their weight in research, both in terms of quality and the amount that they do. We know they work with about 20,000 businesses in Scotland each year. They are effective at producing more spin-outs than other universities in the rest of the United Kingdom. But they tell us that research funding has been cut by 12.9 million. The Global Excellence Fund has been abolished. And it would be helpful to understand why that is and whether the government will consider reversing that. Let me turn to some of the other issues raised. John Swinney outlined the purpose of the EDGE Fund, providing a boost for companies to realise their goals operating very much as a private-public sector partnership. Much to be welcomed there, and it's been well received by the business community, making a difference to their potential and their actual growth. Murdo Fraser talked about public agencies. He asked whether we had too much institutional clutter. Um, I'll leave that to the Economy Committee to mull over. But let me echo some of his comments, because I myself found very positive feedback about Scottish enterprise and Highlands and Islands enterprise, particularly from those account managed businesses. Indeed, many, if not all, of the account managers now have expertise in the businesses they're supporting that they're partnered with, and that has made such a huge difference. At the local end, though, in some areas, Business Gateway provides excellent advice and support, but in other areas, the offering is not met with such positivity. So I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary will take the time to ensure that there is better consistency and at least minimum standards that businesses can expect whatever part of Scotland that they are in. Graham Pearson talked about measuring the things we do better and let me wholeheartedly agree with him. We do need rigorous monitoring to establish whether the commendable actions in the can-do framework actually produce the kind of results we want to see. We can't afford to be complacent. As others have pointed out, our business startups do appear not to be as good as other parts of the United Kingdom. Perhaps our businesses are more sustainable, but we don't know unless we measure outcomes better rather than simply inputs. Scotland is a small country. I regard that as a really positive thing. We're fleet of foot. If something doesn't work, we can ditch it. We can do something better that actually does work, and we can do so quickly. Let me illustrate this with touching on innovation centres. There are eight of them covering everything from oil and gas innovation to stratified medicine Scotland. With Scottish Government investment of £124 million over six years and an expectation of creating 5,000 jobs, this is an important area of work. Yet we don't appear to be focused on what outcomes have been achieved or are likely to be achieved. It would, be, it would appear that so far the only jobs created rather than the 5,000 anticipated are actually only in the running of the innovation centres themselves. So it is genuinely difficult to determine whether innovation centres are a good or a bad thing because we don't measure the outcomes effectively. That is just one example there are others, but I do genuinely think and hope that this is something the Scottish Government will consider further because there is a shared and collective interest in making sure we get this right. Graham Pearson also talked about stability and dependability. It is quite interesting that whatever business I speak to, whether it's large or small, whether it's a new business, a more traditional business, they all say the same thing. They want certainty. Now, that isn't always easy to guarantee. They often express it in different ways, but the kind of words they tend to use are like things like they want it to be stable. They want the environment to be supportive. 
predictable environment. These are all the words that they use. In that context, they find an EU referendum particularly distressing. And I wonder whether the Cabinet Secretary has done analysis on the potential impact of an EU exit on both jobs and exports, um, because the EU matters to the Scottish economy. Um, I am extremely supportive of it, but I do think we need to understand the facts, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will be alive to conducting some of that analysis. I won't mention other referenda, but we do need to make sure that where we can, whenever we can, we create that stable framework in which business can flourish and investment decisions are made in Scotland's interests. Finally, presiding officer, let me turn to the subject of women and let's not forget their contribution. It was touched on by Linda Fabiani and Siobhan McMahon and Siobhan was right to talk about STEM subjects and the difficulty for women um, getting into part-time courses in college. But I want to pay tribute to Women's Enterprise Scotland. Their purpose is to create that entrepreneurial environment where women-led businesses can grow and flourish. And it is really important to our economy that we close that gender gap because there are really low rates of participation by women in entrepreneurship. Let's look at some of the stats. 21% of Scotland's 340,000, I think, SMEs led by women. Men are still twice as likely to start businesses as women are. Now, I recognise this is an international problem, but our rates of female business owners are persistently low when we are compared to other similar high-income countries. So there is much work to be done here. And as John Swinney rightly pointed out, if women's business ownership was equal to men's, we would have something like 108,480 4, 108, extra businesses representing a 32% increase in our business base, leading to an increase of £7.6 billion in GVA to a staggering £13 billion. That's 5.3% of growth in the Scottish economy. We can't afford to ignore that. Finally, presiding officer, John Swinney talks about a renaissance in entrepreneurship. Let's make that happen for women, for men, all of our current entrepreneurs, and hopefully all of our future ones too. Thank you. And thank you very much. And I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Uh, Deputy First Minister, you have until five o'clock. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This has been a, a, a very interesting afternoon and an opportunity for us to reflect on the issues of entrepreneurship, innovation and the support for business development within Scotland. Um, Mr Fraser, in his contribution and in his amendment, um, highlights um, areas of uh, historical weakness uh, but, of course, if we look back further, um, we will stumble across in our history um, a whole variety of different examples of the innovation that, uh, for which Scotland is renowned. And colleagues across the parliamentary chamber have reflected on some of those. Indeed, I'm reminded that um, uh, the United States author, uh, Arthur Herman, uh, wrote a book called How the Scots Invented the Modern World. So we can't, although there may be some business statistics which in the recent past have given us cause for concern, I think there is a substantial backdrop of, of, uh, of strength upon which we can build. I do, however, don't see any of that to deny the fact that we have got to intensify our efforts to encourage and support new business creation within Scotland. That is precisely why we're having this debate today. It's precisely why we formulated the can-do framework. Um, I'm pleased to see the degree of progress that um, we are now making. Um, the latest registration figures show that there were 21,540 new business registrations in 2013, an increase of 23.9% on 2012. And between 2008 and 2013, Scotland's business births increased by 32.8% compared to 296 for the United Kingdom as a whole. So what I deduce from that data is that while there may have been a historical issue in relation to the, uh, the, 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 the level of business startup and business growth within Scotland, uh, we are now seeing the renewed focus and the intensified support being put in place is actually having that beneficial effect. And in that respect, I don't claim all of that credit for the government. I think a lot of that is to do with the way in which different organisations have responded constructively to the appeal that we have made to draw together some of the 
strengthen the thinking across Scotland to make sure we have all of the support that is necessary in place. Siobhan McMahon made the point that um, there is a great strength to be deduced from the way in which we draw together the role of different organisations and agencies to put in place the right support, and I agree entirely with that analysis. Graham Pearson, uh, of course... I am grateful to Ms Swinney for giving way. I wonder, in view of the comments a number of members made during this debate, would you agree that, that more work needs to be done to try and understand why we have had this problem in uh, recent decades of a, a business birth rate that lags behind other comparable parts of the UK? I am not sure there is an additional research process that is required to do that, because I think a lot of good work has been done on this area of activity, particularly by the Hunter Foundation and by the um, the, the Strathclyde University Centre for Entrepreneurship, who have largely covered the ground in which Mr Fraser is interested. And I think it certainly what I take from that research base is that some of the issues that Mr Mason raised, some of the issues about a culture of a preponderance of employment over self-employment, have essentially created some of the backdrop that has led to the performance and the pattern that we have seen. And that's largely reinforced by the evidence that's uh, brought forward by the, um, the, the, Center for, the Strathclyde Centre for Entrepreneurship. Um, so rather than re rehearsing all of that, I think what we need to concentrate on is what can we identify as being the initiatives and the approaches that would help us to tackle that issue. Indeed, in that respect, Graham Pearson um, invited us to be a listening government. And on, on this question, I, I would simply quote Sir Tom Hunter, who in his foreword to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Scotland report in 2013, which is actually a very helpful and informative analysis on the points that are interesting, Mr Fraser. Sir Tom said, the Scottish Government has shown it's not only listening, it's acting. Scotland can do, and the EDGE Fund are great examples of that action. So we, we are very much open to finding the ways in which the constructive activity of government can actually help to address many of these questions as we try to uh, proceed in this respect. Of course. Graham Pearson. <coughs> officer, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to intervene. The comment about a listening government was not meant to be uh, overly critical of the current approach. It might well be easy for Sir Tom Hunter to speak and be heard. The invitation is to make sure that one hears the small entrepreneur who just begins a journey and encourage that development for the future for the thousands that we seek to bring on side. John Swinney. I agree with that point. And one of the, the things I've done, um, a number of my colleagues have done, is to spend time. You know, I've been regularly involved in the uh, presentation of the awards in the EDGE Fund process. And that's a very informative way of finding out how practically difficult it can be for companies. For example, the, the award sizes on the Scottish Edge Fund, it had not struck me that sums of money like £20,000 for a new star entrepreneur can be the difference between making it or not making it. Now, if you'd asked me that question ordinarily, I might not have thought a sum of money of that magnitude would have been so critical. But talking to some of these companies who've made that journey, this is a substantial boost to their activities. So uh, I, I very much agree with Mr Pearson that we have to understand these um, perspectives to ensure that we properly reflect them in the delivery mechanisms that we put in place. One of the other observations that's been made by a number of members is the necessity for all of this to be joined up. And again, I accept that point. And the government will endeavour to ensure that the wherever an individual interacts with the system, they get the quality of advice and signposting which enables them to, uh, to, 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 to make progress. Um, Linda Fabiani, in her contribution, cited a number of different organisations, different business structures that have emerged, that have made a significant contribution in the economy. And one of the ones I would uh, highlight that she raised, and it's particularly relevant to the point that John Mason has advanced during this debate, is the work of um, Mick Jackson through the Wild Hearts Organisation and Microtyco, which encourages school pupils to take very small sums of money and to find ways in which they can develop further entrepreneurial ideas as a consequence. And I would commend that idea uh, to Parliament. Um, Margaret McDougall and Siobhan McMahon and also Jackie Bailey 
all raised the issue of um, women and entrepreneurship. And I hope that I did give due account in my opening remarks to the significance to which I attach to this issue. And it's not something where we can take a great deal of comfort. We have a big challenge to overcome here. But I do think, and I want to commend the work of Women's Enterprise Scotland, who is a self-start group of women who have taken the initiative, culminated very happily very recently in Margaret Gibson, one of its key members, being awarded the Queen's Award for Enterprise, which is an enormous commendation, a worthy and appropriate commendation to Margaret Gibson on that point. And it's important that, again, following the point that I exchanged with uh, Graham Pearson, that we listen carefully to the issues that emerge out of that discussion to find out if there are ways we need to change provision uh, to ensure that we can be more successful um, in this respect. Uh, Stuart Stevenson gave us a, a warning on what I would uh, describe as unintended consequences of legislation. Um, but I think it was a wise piece of counsel in relation to the implications of the Investigatory Powers Bill and how that could undermine the strength of the business environment within Scotland. It, Elaine Murray and Rod Campbell both concentrated on the issue of superfast broadband um, availability uh, in rural Scotland, but I also accept in parts of urban Scotland into the bargain. And I'm just fresh back from a meeting of the Convention of the Highlands and Islands where uh, I was engaged in extensive discussions on what is a major issue about the availability of superfast broadband, because for me, that is one of the key tools that will enable us to encourage business growth within Scotland. If company, one of the characteristics of the New Start business community in Scotland today, compared to 20 years ago, is that most of the New Start business community begins its activities believing it, they are global businesses because they have the technology at their fingertips that enable them to trade wherever they like because of digital connectivity. And what we have to make sure is that that is available everywhere and available credibly everywhere. And I want to reassure Parliament that we are making good progress in this respect. Dr Murray uh, made that point about Dumfries and Galloway, and I'm glad to hear it for the, uh, from the South of Scotland. It's an issue that I've discussed at length with the South of Scotland Alliance, who are anxious to make sure these issues are progressed into the bargain. And I think it's a key instrument in how we take forward our business development agenda um, that organisations have access to credible broadband technology. Uh, and Dr Murray also made the point about credible mobile phone technology. And having spent in large parts of my life in rural Scotland, I can uh, encourage uh, that particular perspective into the bargain. Um, Jackie Bailey um, made a point about the opportunity that exists for us to exercise a fleet of foot because we live in a small country. And I hope members look at the can-do framework and see some of those characteristics implicit within the preparations that we have made. We've taken forward an approach where we have been able to absorb good ideas advanced to us by individuals in Scotland. Um, uh, one of the principal ones has been the approach to the Scottish Edge Fund, which I think has made a significant difference in improving the prospects for the New Start business community in Scotland. We've been responsive to the emerging ideas of the business community and we will continue to do so. But fundamentally, we need to encourage, and this is the cultural point, the aptitude of individuals to wish to become involved in business and to make a constructive contribution in that respect. And that is um, at the heart of the approach that we will take. And the final point I'll make is just on the, the issue, Jackie Bailey closed on the issue of uncertainty. And there was a lot of talk about uncertainty in the run-up to the independence referendum last September. I would simply point out that the Ernst & Young analysis of, of investment, which came out just last week, made it crystal clear that Scotland enjoyed very strong levels of investment, um, second only to the levels of investment and performance of London and the South East for the third year running in the Ernst & Young analysis. And I think that demonstrates that Scotland is an attractive place in which to do business. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scotland Can Do, a framework for entrepreneurship and innovation. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 13338.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser, 
which seeks to amend motion number 13338 in the name of John Swinney on Scotland can do be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members to cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13338.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser is as follows. Yes, 19. No, 58. There were 31 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 13338 in the name of John Swinney on Scotland can do be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.